Sexual abuse, I think it could have been happened to me from when I was three, four years old, I wouldn't know. My first ever memory, uh, I woke up in a bed as a small baby and my mum was having sex with someone in the bed when I was in there. Wooden spoons, hold your hands out, tips of our fingers. If you flinch, you're getting it again. From a wooden spoon to a metal spatula. Then it went from a metal spatula to a belt, oh. pants down, over the knee, belt across the ass. I'd get less of a hit than one of my brothers. You didn't fucking hit her hard enough, hit her again. We would be kicked with army boots on, pulled off bunk beds by my hair, nose bleeding on the floor, kicked in the face. I was praying to God at night, someone save me, someone help me. You can lose faith because if you constantly ask for help, and pray and think maybe there is a God and maybe they will help me and they're not. Um, it made me lose faith because uh, there ain't God and there ain't someone that's going to come and save me. And maybe that's why I don't blame my mum so much because I know how evil her own mother was. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's where I'll become vulnerable to it because... When you just want love from people that are nasty to you, you just want love. You can't help it. This week, we've got Beth Connolly on the Dozen podcast. Thanks for coming. Okay, for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on because I know that you life wasn't always as smooth as it is now. And for those that are tuning in this week to the Dozen podcast, you remember that Nick Collins, big Nick Collins was on last week and he sort of teed you up for your turn, for your opportunity to tell your story, make yourself feel a little bit lighter, share your experience in the hope that it will help not only you, but other people that are watching, which is what these podcasts are all about. It's about building a community of like-minded people, diverse, but we still want to, we want to create an energy and a story that's real and inspiring for the audience to keep them watching and keep them coming back for more, more inspiration and more strength. So, from what I can gather, you and Nick are a power couple. And <clears throat> I always get the measure of a man, how they speak about other people when the other person isn't there mm -hmm. in person. And Nick had nothing but well, wonderful things to say about you and, and powerful. And you weren't there. So it wasn't for your benefit. Mm -hmm. It weren't to get his is getting your good books or get his brownie points or whatever it is that a lot of men do. Mm. You know you do it. Nick was just organic from the heart and he told his story in the hope that it would inspire you to come forward and tell your story. Mm -hmm. And today is your day to do that. And I want to thank you for trusting me to be the person that you share it with because we touched base on it. I know it's dark. I know it's harrowing. I know that life now is, is very, very nice. Mm -hmm. You're in a stable relationship. Yeah. You've got a healthy family. Beautiful You're a power children. couple, beautiful children. Uh, you're both still very much in love after 15 years. How did you, how did you and Nick meet? Oh, God. Nightclubs. I met him, actually, before I ended up actually speaking to him. We met through a mutual friend. So it was my friend's cousin, Night Out. Met Nick. He's gone to the bar, bought a bottle of champagne, given it all the large or whatever, introduced himself to me, gave me a drink or whatever, gone outside to have a fag, and then I've caught him with some birds. So I was like, oh, like, I'm not going to entertain it because if he's caught a bird that quick, just going for a cigarette, like, I'm not wasting my time for someone that doesn't, that isn't interested in me and just wants anyone sort of thing. So ended up that night, didn't end up really speaking to him or nothing like that. Went our separate ways, probably about a, six weeks later or something like that I've gone to a nightclub in my hometown and Nick was there again with my friend's same cousin but I was winding him up I kept slapping his ass all night long basically and then when he kept turning around and saying was it you I was like no it weren't me it was her blaming like random birds and that then he was so drunk he was like trying to chat me up and saying he asked to use my phone, so I've given my phone to use it, but what he actually did was rang his own number from my mobile so he could have my number. Stalker. Smooth. <laughs> Smooth criminal and that. Um, so, yeah, I think he went in for a kiss, but I was like, no, I don't kiss drunk people. Like, 
I'm like drunk and he's drunk. So it's sort of like, I ain't getting with someone when they're steaming because he might not even remember tomorrow. That'd be a bit embarrassing, wouldn't it? Um, so yeah, he started ringing me up, asking me to go around his house and watch a movie with him. But I was like, oh, he could be a bloody murdering psychopath for all I know. Like, did, I he su- did he suggest a particular movie? No, he just wanted to get me around his house. So I weren't really Rambo. sure on it. Like he hadn't <laughs> offered to take me out for dinner or anything. He just wants me straight in the house. But after about a couple of weeks of ignoring him and giving him excuses, I got my mate to take me around there and was like, right, this is the house. If I go missing, send, send the tribe here, basically. <laughs> did, did Nick have a big mouthful of gold teeth back in the day and no. t- tattoos on his head? He had one gold tooth, I think, and a few tattoos. He had the big cross on his back and I think maybe the rosemary beads and the praying hands, a few like that. But did he have any, vi- like, you know, the tattoos he's got on his head now? Did he have? He didn't have none of them. So he didn't look as menacing as he does now? No, and he actually had a really nice smile. And he was, well, this is what attracted me to him. I thought he was a nice boy. He had a nice house. He had a nice family. And I thought, why not? Oh, he makes me laugh. I thought he was really funny. He kept doing things, you know, like when you do things to try and impress people, but you make yourself look like an idiot. And it was just so funny. It just kept me attracted to him. But yeah, he just had that personality. He was loud, boisterous, a bit like me, myself. So we got on really well. So it basically just started from there. And that was 15 years ago? Yeah. Wow. And you're engaged, yeah? We're engaged, yeah. And have you always been in the Bedford area? No, so originally... Um, Northamptonshire. Northamptonshire. So take me right back to the beginning. So this current day here, happy relationship, happy, healthy family, beautiful children, power couple, the future's looking bright, you're settled, you're calm, but it wasn't always a bed of roses. So take me right back to the beginning and let's start your story right from the start. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Um... (laughs) Where did I grow up? Right, so basically I was born in the summer of 1989 to my mum who and dad that already had two siblings, so I've got two older brothers. Um, my mum and dad was in a volatile, domestic, violent relationship. Um, I don't have any memories of my dad. I can't remember him at all sort of thing. So I was born in 89, by the year of 91, we was removed into Northamptonshire by social services on an emergency move to get my mum away from my dad on domestic abuse things. So basically, we got moved into a woman's refuge and I lived there. Um, with, your, with your brothers as well? My two brothers, myself and my mum. Um, I think my mum was suffering maybe with drug use and things like that. So there were short short inter- intervals of care periods between the years of 91 and 93, but um, not nothing that was substantial. So it was like a week here and there, two weeks here and there to help my mum get stable and get on her feet or whatever. Um, and it, basically in the year of 93, when we lived in the Women's Refuge in Northamptonshire, my mum met a man that was in the army and they started dating each other and... I think they was having a bit of domestic violence in their relationship or troubles because he would have to go back to the army and then they would have spaces of when they weren't in contact with each other. So I think that was um, playing on their relationship sort of thing. So my mum, my nan and my mum, I think my nan convinced my mum it would be a good idea for her to marry this man that she just met um, cause he was in the army and she had three kids that weren't his kids and it would make her look like a stand up woman or whatever sort of thing. So she's basically gone to the guild hall in Northampton with this man and married him. And then it was like, this is your dad. And what's this guy's name? Uh, his name was Mark Heath. You say was, is he no longer with us? No, he said, oh, he's, he, that is his name, Mark Heath. I don't know whether he's changed his name or whatever. Okay, so Mark, so Mark Heath at the time was, he, he, he slotted into the stepdad role. Started, slotted into the stepdad role. Maybe I should make it more clear. So by the time I was born, my mum was only 21. So when she was 21, she had three children. And by the time of 1993, when she met Mark, he was five years younger than my mum. Right. 
So my mum met Mark and he was a 19-year-old boy and she would have been a 23, 24-year-old woman with three kids. So basically they've rushed, got married, moved to the barracks together. That's very young for Mark to uh, to take on a family with three children from a very dysfunctional background. Let me just let's quickly go back to your biological father. So within the first four years of your life, you're put into, into a, a woman's refuge for protection. And you mentioned your mum may have been addicted to substances. Was your mum using substances while she was carrying you, while she was pregnant with you? Not that I know of, and I, I, if I'm honest, I think it was more like cannabis, um, base, speed, sort of things like that. So with my real dad, he had an acid problem back then in the 90s. I think it was like quite common for people to do acid and things like that. But it was the domestic violence um, between them. It was just ridiculous. I mean, if I look through my social services records, it says like in 1991, the neighbours have rang the police because we... Me and my brothers were on the roof of the house while a domestic violence was going on inside the house. By the time the police have got there, all three children was back inside the house through the window. So I think like a lot fell on my older brother because he was the oldest. He's three years older than me. He basically, his job was to look after me and my middle oldest brother. Like, And that violence must have been pretty extreme because back in the early 90s, you had to do something extreme for it to be noticed and flagged and acted on by the police because my dad's side of the family, there's a there's a history of domestic violence. It's, uh, yes, it's unpleasant, so I can totally relate to this, whereas nowadays it's more spoken about on the internet, mm-hmm. there's more awareness. You know, if a neighbour hears raised voices in someone's house, the police are on your doorstep. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, you know, it wasn't like that. You could, no. have, you could have a rave in your garden, the police wouldn't turn up. So it must have been pretty bad. Yeah. And it's certainly for a, a young girl where all really you can remember from that is trauma, but a blur. Mm. You know it was traumatic, but you can't pinpoint an isolated incident because mm-hmm. you say you can't remember, actually really remember your biological father. So he's even a blur. Yeah. And do you think that's you've... You've masked him as a man because it was so traumatic or you're just too young to remember? Well, if I'll put it like this. My first ever memory, uh, I woke up in a bed as a small baby and my mum was having sex with someone in the bed when I was in there. So I woke up and I was screaming and I was crying and my memory is my mum's friends come in the room. I can physically remember her name. My name was Donna and she had blonde hair. So this was would have been before my mum was moved to Northampton in the refuge. So this is while your mum and dad were still together? I presume so, yeah, because we would have lived in Kettering where I was born. And I can just remember being sat on my mum's friend's lap with a bottle and I can physically just remember my mum's friend saying, this is fucking out of order. Like basically sort of slagging off my mum for what she's done and obviously for her having to get me out of the situation and sit on my lap or whatever. So my first ever memory is a traumatic memory. Your mum was having sex with a stranger in the same room as you? Someone, someone, yeah, when I was in the bed. Wow. Yeah. And where was your dad at this time? I don't know because I can't remember him. No, but but they but to you as far as you remember, they were still together. They were still a couple, and he could have he could he may well have been at work. She might have split up with him and just started going out on the town drinking and bringing back anybody. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And did he was he was he a working class man? Did he have a job? Your dad? No, criminal. No, yeah, not a very nice man at all. I mean, I met him when I was fifteen, and it was sort of. Uh, Oh, you're my daughter. I love you. Um, I did batter your mum. I did do this and that. I admit to it. That doesn't justify any of it. Did did he try and justify why he beat your mum up? Not really, but I'd say he's fucked in the head. By the time I met him and I was 15, he was like in and out of mental hospitals, diagnosed schizophrenic. Uh, you know, like, had a new wife and she was a blimmin' nutcase. Like, it was just, like, when I went there, I was, like, intrigued. Okay, I'll go meet my new dad and see or whatever. When I walked into the situation and I see, evaluated it and see what was really going on, it was too much for me. And I just thought, Do you know what? I've already got so much shit that I have to deal with. I don't want this shit as well. And it was, like, the second time I see him, he bumped into me in town and he stopped me and asked me for £5 for a cup of tea. So that was like a red flag, like, nah, Mm. I ain't seen this man my whole life. He's never done one thing for me, and you're asking me for money. 
So it was like, you, they're not interested. You're looking for leadership in a parent, aren't you? Yeah. You don't want to be giving your dad five pounds for cups of no. tea. It should be the other way around. Yeah. So by the time, so already by the time you were four, you'd experienced trauma and darkness that, the majority of people will spend their entire life living and never get to experience, which is lucky for them. And then it gets worse. Am I right? Well, it does get worse. So we live on the Barretts. They start having domestic violence between them. It says in my records, they were kicked off the Barretts. So he was kicked out of the army. I'm not sure what's happened or what. If I go by memory and what my mum's told me, Something's happened between them and his sergeants got involved and my mum's deputy sergeant. So that has caused trouble for him, obviously, and they've dismissed him from the army, I believe. To which then we've moved to a different address in Oxfordshire. Bister. Did your mum have a traumatic childhood? So, like, just be, like, I just want to make sure I say this and put it out there because I do not want anyone trying to like harass my mum or anything because I love my mum to death. It doesn't matter what I've been put through. And my mum has had a terrible upbringing, something I would have just never knew about until I'm now this age. So it would have been hard to understand and mm. things until I'm now at the age where I understand things more. And I'm like, right, okay. Not that it justifies things, but it makes it a bit more understandable of maybe where her head was at. That's what I wanted to get a grasp of because she, uh, she's gone from one violent man to another violent man. It just seems there's a, there's a pattern of trauma bonding there. There's so a pattern of abuse, sexual abuse, trauma, violence in my family for a long time. And I feel like I've, broke the chain from me and my family continuing. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Okay, so to take it back to the army barracks when things were, were progressively getting worse for you. Right, so my mum has always done this thing, right? She's always gone to bed in the daytime from as far back as I can remember. And I'm talking music's playing like you're in a nightclub. My mum, I, I wouldn't have understood this because I was a child. Is that because she was off her head on drink and drugs? No, I think maybe that was because through mental health and trauma, but I just never knew. Sort just of the thing. noise. She uses the noise to block out the pain yeah, to so get to sleep. Yeah, I can remember all throughout my life, if I went in my mum's room in the day and she was asleep, she was asleep, but she's rocking back and forth like no one's flipping business mm. and the music's boom, blaring like you're in a nightclub. So I can remember my mum's got her music on, she's in bed asleep, my brothers are upstairs in their room. I've come downstairs with something. I can distinctly remember exactly what I was wearing. I was wearing a, a certain nighty, And I'm coming down the stairs and my mum's husband stood in the hallway and the dogs sat next to him. So this is Mark. Yeah. And so they're, they're now married as well. They're married. Um, so he's official stepdad. He's official stepdad. It was drilled into us, we call him dad. Okay. So it wasn't a decision we made ourselves. It was that's your dad to call and, him dad. And as far as your memory is concerned, your recollection, he was dad. Yeah, I don't remember our mum before him. Um, so basically, I can remember I was walking down the stairs, minding my own business, sort of like a world of my own. I've sort of always, I describe myself as Tracy Beaker because I'm very in with just thinking deep thoughts and things like that. So I'm walking downstairs. He's at the bottom of the stairs and he says to me, come here and give me a kiss. It's my birthday. I said, no. And how old would you have been now? Four or five. This is your first traumatic memory yeah. of your dad, who wasn't your dad, Mark Heath. Stepdad, yeah. Um, come here now and give me a kiss. I said, no. The dog's growling at me. The dog was sat next to him going, and you know like what dogs do when they're warning you off sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. He's grabbed the dog by the collar. He said, I've got the dog. Don't worry about the dog. I said, come here now and give me a kiss. I took two steps off the stair, one step towards him. He's gone out with his hand. I can just remember a dog jumping at me like, if you look at my hands, I've got scars on my hands. So my initial reaction was I put my hands in front of my face. The dogs jumped on top of me. I'm on the floor. I think the dog had my head in its mouth and was shaking. Uh, the next thing I remember is the dog being took off me and him not being there. So I've woke up and I'm on the floor and I've crawled 
hand, hand by hand and I've gone up the stairs and directly at the top of the stairs is my mum's bedroom. So I've like gone to open the bedroom door with my hand. The, the, the door, doors creaked open and literally I can remember my mum rocking and then she's sat up, looked and I can just remember her scream. And I think I collapsed. I was on the floor. My mum said she could just see blood pouring everywhere. She said she jumped up out of the bed. She screamed my older brother. Get her in the room. Ring an ambulance. Ring an ambulance. Mark's nowhere to be seen. She's ran downstairs. What the fuck's happened to my daughter? Sort of thing. Her, like, because I said to her, she said to me, basically, when she's gone downstairs and said, what the fuck's happened to me? He's made out... I've walked into the living room, hesitated, and then walked again, and the dogs just attacked me. A 10-second gap, apparently, is what he said. Um, ambulance has come. I can just remember being in the ambulance, and they were wrapping me up. I was like, It was like I was a mummy or something. They were just strapping me, strapping me, strapping me with bandages. And I can remember the woman in the ambulance saying to me, you're a pretty princess, you're a pretty princess, but... The shock, I think I was in immediate shock and the adrenaline, it's something I've never experienced since that day. Um, basically, I was in extreme shock. My mum said I was in that much shock, I didn't speak for weeks. The hospital actually injected me with adrenaline because they were so worried about how shocked I was. My mum said, Mark, come to the hospital he sat with me in his arms the whole time. He wouldn't put me down. And the hospital, doctors and nurses were ex saying they couldn't work out how a dog could have done all these injuries to me in a 10-second space gap because it's not physically possible, basically. If that was to happen now, because you, you said at the beginning that... They said if I, the dog would have had me for 10 seconds longer, I'd be dead. Yeah, and I don't doubt that at all. That is a, that is a, a horrific a version of events. Even to listen to, that nearly, uh, that nearly sent me over the edge. But if that was to happen now, the dog would be, would be put down. In the me dog was put down. I was. So this is even more sick. This is how you know. Because you said he, re he repeatedly even... let a dog attack you. So basically, what, what they've done is when they've come back from the hospital, he's obviously blamed the dog, made out, I've just hesitated, and the dog's just attacked me for no reason or whatever. My mum said as soon as they've come back from the hospital, they've took the dog straight away to the vets to get the dog put down. She said that dog was laid on the floor, crying its eyes out, right? She said the dog looked at her and gone, mm, like, as if to say it knew what it'd done. And he just sat there the whole time, emotionless, not nothing. You've just had to sit and watch a dog be put down because you set it on me and you're sat there with no remorse, no feelings, no nothing, nothing. Well, he's a psychopath, isn't he? Well, you, you must be. You've got to be, ain't you, in some kind of way to set a dog on a small child. Then act like you're, you're saving me or you're there protecting me and then watch the poor animal be put to death for something you've done. Maniac. Maniac behaviour. And then what, what, what come next after that incident? So basically... He, so he obviously had everybody hoodwinked that... He was the innocent party. He was still the, the loving stepdad. And it, what that it was is, the dog's fault. I feel like because my mum has issues, obviously, and I wouldn't have known about because I would have been so young, you, you wouldn't probably... When you're a small child or a baby, you won't know if your mum's got hit, mental health problems. You'll just... Whatever you grow up around will just be normal to you because it's your you lifestyle and it's your parent or whatever, right? So I feel like everyone liked him because they thought... Oh, she's a fucking handful. She's hard to deal with. You know, like, he's the good man. He's being a good stepdad to these three children and he's helping, he's helping my mum when really he's not doing nothing of the sort. Do you know what I mean? He's a soldier. He's fighting for his country. Yeah. But, um, was he charming? Very charming. Very, a lot, very liked in f friends and neighborhood and people will probably trust their kids with him. Mm. Which is even more scary, do you know what I mean? But not uncommon within narcissistic maniacs like that. So basically, the dog thing's happened. I've got to be between the age of four and five because in my social services records, it might be 95, 96, they're speaking about injuries to me that were from a dog from a few years prior. So that's got to be before the year of 1995. 
Yeah? Mm-hmm. So, basically, something happens. We move out of Oxfordshire. We then move to Derbyshire. 1994. And how, how old would you have been now? Four years old. You're now four? Four or five. Four or five. Okay. We grew up in a strict army routine schedule, me and my two brothers. So we were being army drilled at three in the morning out of our beds. I would be woke up to my mattress being lifted up midair, falling to the floor, to the hard ground, get up. Downstairs now. Downstairs. Get downstairs. Oldest, middle oldest, youngest in the line. This is Mark doing this? My mum and Mark together. A chair like how you're sat in front of me, he'd be sat in the chair, she would be stood next to him. We're being chastised. Um, a, like- pack, a packet of biscuits has gone missing. Who's took the biscuits? I haven't took the biscuits. I haven't took the biscuits. I haven't took the biscuits. Um, wooden spoons. Hold your hands out. Tips of our fingers. If you flinch, you're getting it again. Any flinching or moving or hesitation, you're getting beat again. So we would each watch each other being chastised, physically abused. Um, and who was doing the physical abusing? So a lot of the time it was Mark, but I felt like my mum was definitely getting pleasure out of it because they was encouraging each other. Or it'd be like, I'd get less of a hit than one of my brother's. You didn't fucking hit her hard enough, hit her again. So it was like for their pleasure, if I, if I'd say, because there could be no other reason why you're waking your kids up at three in the morning to be brutally punished and battered and intimidated for no reason. It didn't make any sense. And had biscuits even gone missing? Probably, but we were being starved. There weren't food in our house. We didn't really have nothing. So. And how much older are your brothers than you? So my oldest brother is three years older than me and then my second brother is just a year older than me. So all close, all with the same dad? Yeah, so my oldest brother is 86. My middle brother is 88, and then I'm 89. Right. But okay. we all have the same biological father. So up until now, you've all experienced the same trauma? Yeah, but I believe maybe my oldest brother the worst. Mm. Because it's now his responsibility to take care of me and my middle brother and to do jobs that my mum wants him to do. So not only like was we being woke up and hit with the wooden spoons, it then went on more. So then it went from a wooden spoon to a metal spatula. Then it went from a metal spatula to a belt. I could literally describe the distinctive belt. So he had a big brown leather belt and the buckle, it was like an oval, oval shape with an eagle on it and the American flag. I could tell you because the amount of times I've had it imprinted on my fucking ass cheek, it should be a permanent mark, do you know what I mean, sort of thing. So it was like simple pants down, over the knee, belt across the ass. The weird thing was, is that after like these punishments and brutal beatings were happening to us, we were just put back to bed. Like it was the norm? Yeah, so then it was like, in the morning I would wake up, but I'd think, have I just... Have I just dreamed it? Like, I'm a, like, did that really even happen? Do you know, like, sort of thing, like, you have to clarify with your own brain if it's really happening to you or whether it's a dream or not, sort of thing. Because mm. you get up in the morning and then it's like, everyone's acting normal. What do you want for breakfast? Like, oh, you've got to go to school. Do you know what I mean? Well, they're programming you to think it's normal so you don't repeat what's gone on at school. So we was programmed, I can't remember from what age, but we was always told we're never allowed to speak. You don't speak back. You don't speak unless you're spoken to. You don't tell anybody any business of anything from anyone. you got to think, we didn't have no family. So it was like me and my brothers, my mum and her husband. Did you, at the time, do you, do you remember feeling as if you'd actually done something wrong and you deserved that punishment? I don't remember. I just remember I wasn't happy. No. I was sad. And I was quiet and I, we didn't, we didn't play with other kids unless we was at school. So it was sort of, we played together, me and my brothers. Could you sense that you was being abused as opposed to being punished? Probably not. Um, so you assume that you had done something wrong and deserved the punishment? Well, if I go by like social services records and things like that, 
they would hit my brothers in front of me to teach me a lesson of what happens to naughty children. But I think that's why I'm so empathetic because mm. to sit and watch someone you love and care about be hurt by people and then laugh and to say it's to teach you a lesson, I felt guilty like it was my fault they were being beat. So although they might have done something wrong or whatever, it's sort of like you use them and hurting them to hurt me as well. Do you know what I mean? So, so they knew that it was emotionally damaging for each of us to see each other in um, certain positions. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, we was, like, basically chastised, taught not never to say nothing. We was never registered at doctors, dentists, like... So we only ever really had involvement with people they were friends with or when we went to school and that was it so I'd say yeah from then we lived in Derby and then we, so we was being battered and abused sort of and well it's and you're, you're being subjected to both physical and psychological abuse yeah basically and then we moved from there we moved um I lived, I can't work out if I lived in a place called Warsop first or Sutton and Ashfield. And just before you go to the, ne uh, the next destination, you said that he would, that you, you, your pants would be pulled down and they'd hit you with the belt buckle. Did your brothers have exactly the same, their we pants pulled down? We all had the exact same treatment. Because he's, we he's, would be kicked with army boots on. I just wanted to know how quickly it escalated, what levels. So quite, I'd how, say how quickly, rapidly he was increasing his levels quickly, of abuse. And then the the um, it was like the more power he was gaining over the situations, and the more my mum was allowing to happen in these situations. So it'd be like bed with no dinner. So we weren't really getting fed a lot. I think at the age of five, I probably weighed three stone and that's what my three year old, four year old son weighs, you know what I mean? So it was like we was growing in height and things like that, but we wasn't ever gaining weight and momentum sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? So it was mm -hmm. like constant having us in a lack of, a lack of love, a lack of affection, a lack, a lack of everything. Like we didn't really get love. We didn't get cuddles and kisses. We didn't really get none of that. And then if I did get it, I would be getting it from him and not my mum. And then it was weird because if you look in my social services records, it says they would be inappropriate and call my mum's husband my boyfriend. And I'm a four-year-old little girl. So, like... And who, who made this statement? Social services. Saying yeah. that when they've observed and meeting between me and my mum and a stepdad. So basically it went along the walls of my mum directed how play should go. He would get involved with play and then we would, she would chastise us and encourage us to chastise each other. But that's what I was going to say as well. So it was when we was getting beat and sent to bed and not fed and things, everything was a competition. So... We was on army, like, routines. Like, we wake up, we all had a bedroom to clean. We all had to wash, dry. One wash, one dry, one put away. One hoover, one polish. Like, I'm not joking, yeah. I was cleaning houses at four years old. Me, my brother, me, my five-year-old brother, my seven-year-old brother. We all had a chore every day to do. And this is, like, the manipulation and twisted part of it as well. So they w wanted to encourage us to clean and to keep the house tidy, obviously, yeah. But what they would do as our treat was we would all get a sweet once a week. But what they would do is they'd go shop, they'd buy a big size Mars bar. Then they'd buy a Milky Way. Then they'd buy a Fredo bar. Whoever's room's the cleanest gets the biggest bar. Whoever's room's the second cleanest gets the second big, biggest bar. And whoever ain't done good enough gets the littlest bar. So that now enters sibling rival rivalry mm. because we all want the big big bar of chocolate. We don't really get chocolate and sweets. We want we all want it. So that causes trouble between me and my brothers. And if you're being rationed and you're always in a constant yeah. state of starvation, yeah. of course, friction. So it was like so it was causing trouble between us. And my oldest brother would bully my middle brother, and then I would intervene and fight my older brother for my 
middle brother, you know, because I could tell he was, I basically knew my brother was bullying him to get, win and get what he won because he was older. And I didn't think that was fair, obviously. It was more of you get the rules or rules sort of thing, whatever. But I feel like that was another, another like way to control things and to try and cause problems. So Mark has come in, he's divided your mum from the three of you and then he's divided the three of you from each other, which gives him ultimate power. Yeah, but then always also gives the power of secluding me from other people. Mm. So two boys, the two boys share a bedroom, classic rules in most people's houses, right? Yeah. The girl stays in the bedroom on her own, right or wrong. Yeah. So he's already won that in my head. I didn't know if my brothers are being abused or not because they're not in the same bedroom as me. And you was told not to speak to each other about it or anybody else? Anybody. Don't speak about anything ever. And then I sort of feel like maybe the dog attacking me, that lit a switch in my head to where I was never going to say a word. Out of fear? Well, of course, because look what happened to me. Hmm. I said no. And this dramatic, terrible thing has happened to me. So it's now of, you don't say no. You just do what you're told. Do you know what I mean, sort of thing? I mean, even if the dog attack hadn't have taken place, the fear of a fully grown soldier hitting you with spatulas and belt buckles, that's enough to put the fear of God into anybody. And it's certainly a child. It's more like that with my mum as well. Like, so I'd get, like, forever as a child, they cut all my hair off. I probably had shorter hair than a boy with curtains throughout my whole life. And they would say, oh, it's because you get nits and things like that. But I felt like that was another way to keep my confidence down. Humiliate you? Yeah. Embarrass me and have kids point and say, ah, oh, you look like a boy. So we've moved from, we've moved from Oxfordshire. Moved from the barracks. We now live in Derbyshire. We go to, a, we go to a new school. We're meeting new people. We're not really allowed out. Well, this is the thing. We were always grounded or we was always in trouble for something. So they'd be like, oh, it's the kids. They're feral. They smash up the house. They do this and that. And the truth is, we were the ones keeping the fucking house in order. Do you know what I mean? Didn't people at school, didn't the teachers notice that you've got marks on your fingers where you're being hit? Well, so basically, this is what happened. No, because if you hit someone on the end of the fingertip, it doesn't bruise or leave any marks. So that's another sort of, like crazy thing. So they know how to hit us without leaving bruises, without people to recognise we're being hit. Yeah. So yeah? What, what what he was doing wasn't impulsive; it was calculated. Yeah, obviously. Um, so we moved there. I went to a school it was called Carsick Carsick Junior School. I can remember I used to do things at school. So it might sound weird to people, but basically, I wanted a, I wanted mum mum's attention because I didn't get it. Mm. So when I was at school, I'd do things. I'd pretend to have an asthma attack. And I'd go, <gasps> and I'd do that for ages, like basically just trying to get a teacher to think there's something wrong with me. And then in the end, they'd be like, oh, something's wrong with her. I can remember this one time, right? They've got my older brother and they've said, read her a story to keep her calm until we can get someone to come and collect her. So I can remember I kept doing, because <gasps> I didn't want him to know I was faking it sort of thing, right? And he's reading me a story. And it must have distracted me from faking my um, asthma attack, right? And I can remember, like, pure as day, he's looked at me and he went, hey, look at that, you've stopped breathing funny now. And I've gone, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing it again straight away. And then I can remember they were like, your parents are here to collect you. And I'm like, yes, my mum, my mum's come to collect me. Like, I can spend time with her or whatever. I go out to reception. It's not my mum. It's Mark. <clears throat> So, like, it didn't matter what I did to try and gratify my mum's attention. I still couldn't get it. Mark had all of her attention. Yeah. So, like, basically, we went to the school there. At school, we would have just seen, like, a normal normal kids. Well, basically, it says in my records, school thought I was underachieving. I was quiet. I would sometimes cry in the playground. I presented as unhappy was what it says in my record sort of thing. My oldest brother, well, it says it was the end of school term and we was missing from school for a few weeks, right? Then you've had half term, which is two weeks. Then you have a new term. They said, we've missed two weeks. 
before the end of term, the two weeks of term, and then two weeks going back. And then when we have come back, they've noticed a black eye on my oldest brother, to which then he's been questioned what's happening, whatever. To which my brother's reply was, my mum pinned me down so Beth could punch me in the face. So he did something to Sean that upset him. And they they used to do this thing when we was little, right? So if one of us hurt each other, they'll hold them and then we can punch them. It's it's quite sick in the head, isn't it? But mm. as sick as it is, like, this was normal to me. So Stephen's done something to Sean. Sean's too scared to hit Stephen back. I'll fucking punch him. What kind of four, five-year-old kid does this? So I've run at my brother and punched him as hard as I can in the face and give him a black eye. He's then gone to school with a black eye. He's then being questioned at school. He's told the school, my mum's held me down and let Beth punch me in the face. And did your mum hold him down? Yeah. They both held his arms behind his back. I can remember it. it's happened numerous of times for us, right? Um, so basically the school immediately has contacted social services. Um, social services has come to my mum's, questioned her and Mark. He's admitted, admitted, this is what they said, we chastised the children and I've hit them with a belt a couple of times. So they were making out we was terrible and we were ruining their lives and they were just doing it as a discipline to try and help us learn a lesson or whatever sort of thing, right? It's then been noticed we've got no doctors, no dentist. They then wanted it and an immediate in immediate effects, basically, come to school, get us from school, take us into a, immediate care. This is 1995. We was removed September 1995 for interim straight away because of all the domestic violence and the bruises on my brother and whatever, and they wanted us to be checked out by hospitals and make sure we had full body so they could get to the bottom, basically, of what had been going on. Um, they've put me in a care home with a woman who already had a kid in care. I can remember the girl was called Alice. I can remember it for all day. She was, she was 16. I was five. I've just, but now we're at this stage here. Mm-hmm. I know at the start you, you said you don't want anybody thinking bad of your mum because now you understand things a lot clearer. But, but that, at that moment in time, do you think your mum was groomed or do you think she was equally as sadistic? I think because she... I know it's a tough question. Yeah, because she... Because you love your mum still. Yeah, so because she's got all these mental health problems and she would have had them then and just not knew what it was, and because, like I said to you, she had a similar upbringing but was manipulated by her own parent, couldn't, couldn't that blind you? Like, so if she's had all these things happen to her and her own mum's convinced her shut the fuck up, just get on with it. Can that in her own head make her think it's normal? Well, have you done to your children what your mum done to you? No, because I know it's wrong. Mm. I think people do know right Which is wrong. Which is why I question things, because if, I think if I know that, she must have knew that. But then I'm, I'll go back to, oh, it was a different time back then. Because mm-hmm. it was, and I'm not going to say, it was a lot different then to what things are now, right? But either way, I've got put in care. I'm five years old. This girl's 16. I've got to share a bedroom with her. She was fucking battering me. Any chance she could. The woman would go out and leave me in the care of this 16-year-old girl that's in care. She was trying to lay on top of me and tell me grown adults have sex and this is how they do it. And she was rubbing up and down on me. And then if I didn't want her to, she would fucking punch me in the arm and tell me not to say anything. So, And you're, like, she's 16 and you're... Five. Okay, so there's a big, big, big age gap. Yeah. She's an adult. She's in care, to though, you. as well, remember, right? So obviously something's happening with her separately to whatever I've been going through. So it's sort of like I play with her because I'm in care with her and I'm supposed to play with her. And like when you're in care, you play with each other, whatever. But she was older. She knew right from wrong. She knew what she was doing to me. She was trying to kiss me and stick her tongue in my mouth or whatever. But she was being physically assaulted by girls in the neighbourhood. So I can physically remember walking shop with her one day. Um, in 
Derbyshire, it, there's a lot of jetties. You call their alleyways, they're called jetties up there. So it's sort of like jetties, they lead on to different jetties and they take you to different streets and different shops or whatever. I can remember I've walked shop with this girl since she was 16 and I can remember we've come out the shop and I can distinct, distinctly remember a group of about three or four girls saying, there she fucking is. And the girl that I was in care with, Alice, she was like, run! And I'm thinking, why do I have to run? I don't know none of these girls. Like, they're all te fully teenagers or whatever. I've run with her. We've run in an alleyway because back then, like, they had alleyways that led to your back garden of your house. And I can remember we've been collared in this alleyway by a group of girls, right? They kicked shit out of her. I stood and watched. And I can remember one of them went, what about her? And one of the other ones went, no, we don't want to do nothing to her, leave her. I just stood and watched them kick shit out of her. I didn't run and get help. I didn't do anything. I just stood and watched. Scared? I don't think I was. I think I felt happy. Desensitised to it by that stage, no doubt. Right, I probably thought she, she deserves it sort of thing, right? Oh, of course, because she's a... Yeah. So then... I think I was there, maybe a space of a, cu a couple of months or whatever, right? But basically, I can remember I, we had visitation with my mum, but it was a lot of visitation. I didn't realise how much fucking visitation you get back then with social services. So I'm sure they don't do it now. We were having three two-hour sessions at a visiting hall a week. That's like six hours a week of visitation. You don't normally get that when you've been removed from your parents, right? And w during the visitation, would it be your mum and Mark or just your mum? Mum and Mark, and then it would be social worker person observing, observing basically the play and what's being said and what's going on. Would there always be someone there to witness? Yes. Okay, good. So that that's basically where I've got a lot of information because it's what someone's ob observed. So like, if I've gone and questioned my mum, she'll be like, no, that, that's not fucking true. They're fucking lying or whatever. It is true. You just don't want to admit to it sort of thing, right? So the only reason they were probably coming to the things and that is because social services were paying for them to come there. So they were following the rules that social services were giving them. They were coming to the meetings and they were seeing us, even though it says there was no love and affection showed and my mum was just shouting at us and... In front of a witness? Yeah, like basically directing what we should do and then calling one of us a fat twat and then encouraging the other kids to then be nasty to another kid. Like, this is how bad it is. Like, my mum would call my brother a thick cunt and then try and get me and my brother to antagonise him and call him a thick cunt as well. Do you get what I mean? Like, and laugh and be like, ah, it's just a joke. It's it's incredible that you show so much forgiveness and empathy, I've got to say. So so far, she doesn't sound like a pleasant person well, at all. Well, so yeah, so then I've got put in care. I can remember I've gone to see my mum one day, and I was just like, I was fed up, man, of this girl fucking hitting me. And, oh, I don't know this girl. She's not my family or nothing like you've got to remember. She's a lot older than me or whatever, right? You used to, when, you're, when you're put in that environment, is it almost like this is now your foster sister? Well, it's not. It's just like you're a child. You know you don't live at home and you know you're living in somewhere and someone's older than you and they're bossing you around and hitting you. So she's just a person, not a foster sister? Yeah, so I didn't class her as my sister. I knew she weren't my sister. I just see her as a girl, an older girl. And you've got to think, I've not had... A dominant girl. I've not had any woman encouragement or anything. Like, my, my own mum doesn't hug and kiss me. I've been in stages of care already throughout 91 and 93, so it's sort of like, what kind of bond do we have? I don't know, because if you're not giving me any love, was I getting any love as a small child? I disagree. I don't think so. Do you know what I mean, sort of thing? So I've gone to visit my mum, and I said, I don't want to go back there. And they kept, I was trying to get off the, like, the taxi. I was screaming, kicking off, going mad. And my mum must have just thought, something's not right. She doesn't normally do this sort of thing, right? And it was the person that I've said, what's the matter? And I've said, it's Alice. She keeps kissing me and hitting me. So then they're sort of like, hold on. We've got to take, we've got to take what she said on board. So basically, from my paperwork, I've been took back to the same house that night after I've told them. But they've made Alice sleep in a separate bedroom from me. So how long was you living with Alice? Probably about two months, six weeks maybe, something like that. Within right? that six weeks, she yeah. was heavy-handed and trying to kiss yeah. you. Yeah, 
So I've been moved from that care home to another care home. So a man, married man and woman, and they had four four kids living with them. I think some of them was their kids and some of the kids were in care. I can remember, actually, because I spent, like, Halloween there, and I can remember she put a black bin bag over my head and dressed me up as a witch. It's quite weird, actually. I remember a lot of stuff about care because I had key moments. So we didn't know what the cinema was. We didn't know what swimming was. Like, normal activities people would do with their families and kids, mm. we didn't know. We didn't know what birthdays were. We didn't know what Christmases were. It says in my files, they don't believe we ever knew, celebrated a birthday or a Christmas ever. That we think they just, like, didn't mention it, so we didn't know any different sort of thing, yeah? Um, it says one time... Is this your parents, the foster parents? This is my parents. So we never had Christmases and birthdays and things like that. I didn't know when my birthday was, when I was questioned. They said to me, when's your birthday? And, what the fuck's that? Sort of thing, yeah. So no presents, no love, nah. no celebrations, no going out for dinners. Nah, nothing like that. And then no Christmas tree. No, nah, so I can remember physically one year waking up Christmas Day, my mum screaming and shouting downstairs. We lived in certain in Sutton in Nashville. We definitely lived in Sutton in Nashville here, right? So it's either before I've gone in care or after I've been in care. We've come downstairs and there's a Christmas tree on the floor and a couple of bits of wrapping paper on the floor. We've been burgled. Christmas Eve. They've took all your presents. They've took all our food. They've rang. I can distinctly remember we had um, the British, is it the Red Army? Red Cross Army? Or the Salvation Army. Salvation. It's the Salvation Army. They turn up on Christmas. People that are, ain't got nothing can basically mm. try and help you and give you a Christmas. They gave me a doll. I, I fucking loved it. I've never been so happy in my life, man, mm. for this one little doll. I think my brothers had a little something each. But it says in our records, she's made out we've been burgled, right, Christmas Eve. I truly don't believe we were burgled. They didn't have no money. They didn't have nothing. They've tried to play social services. We've been burgled. The social worker's written the thing. I believe Michelle and Mark have took all of their belongings, sold them all, Gone elsewhere, sold them all for money. Who's Michelle? That's my mum. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mention her name, but that that's my mum's name, basically, yeah? So they're basically saying that they believe they've took all the contents of our house and sold it to get money, obviously to feed their drug habit or whatever they were doing with their money because they weren't fucking spending it on us for anything. And what, right? what drugs were they using throughout that period of time? I don't know because Base I'm... and Yeah, because you're saying. I'm so young... Because I would have been so young, I'm like I'm up to date now on drugs and what drugs they would have been doing. And when I got older, I sort of knew what was going on. But because I was so young back then, I wouldn't have known. What could be more important than buying your kids Christmas presents? Wow. Yeah. So basically, I did I did Halloween in care. We did Christmas. I can remember I was Christmas. It was really weird, right? Because it was the first Christmas I'd ever woke up and I'd not been with my brothers. Like Nick says it now, you, I'm weird for my brothers, but I say to him, I think mine and my brother's connection is so strong because they're the only people that have lived through what I've lived through. So we've been through the same shit, so it makes us bonded, like, connected in a way other people probably wouldn't be with their brothers. So I'm protective over my brothers. And nobody, I probably act like their mum and I'm their younger sister. Nobody would ever understand either. No. Nobody. And Nick will say, your brother's an asshole, whatever, whatever, but... It don't matter. They're my brothers. I love the I love the bones of them, sort mm. of thing. Um, so yeah, like woke up, had you had to eat your breakfast before you got to open your presents, which I thought was strange because obviously I've never had a routine where you have breakfast before you open presents or whatever. So it was. Str I can just remember it being weird, but they were all right. They didn't do anything nasty to me. Nothing like that. There was a nice man and woman. They took care of me. And how did you get on with the other foster kids and their kids? I can't really remember. I think I just played with them. I think I was got on fine with them, if I'm honest with you. But there was no trauma or dysfunction that you can recall? Not in that care home. But my care home, it was where we had a big table like this in the care home that I was in. And my brothers, so we would have our visitation with my mum and her husband, but we would also have our own visitation because we're siblings, obviously. So once a week, my brothers would come to my care home and we would watch a film or have time together, basically. And I can remember 
Can you remember Mr. Miyagi, the karate kid? Yeah. Me and my brothers love stuff like that when we were young. And they come to see me one day and we watch that. <coughs> and um, the carers all made us a cup of hot chocolate each. And they've put it on the table in front of us. Me and my brothers acting out the film, doing this or whatever. One of my brothers has gone, the hot chocolate has gone all over him, severely burnt his crotch and private area. Immediately, the carers have shit themselves. They don't know what to do. They've run, they've put him upstairs. He's in a cold bath. They're running cold water on him. He gets took to hospital. He's got whatever percentage burns on him or whatever. So that goes into my mum's favour, as well as the thing that's happened with me, with Alice, because it's classed as... um, Self-harm? No, it's classed as neglect through social services because they're not safeguarding your kids that they've took off you. To oh, safeguard I see. Sort of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So basically... That, that, and then my other brother, he was in a separate care home. He's getting fucking battered by his foster parents, real kid. He was bullying him and taking the remote off him. And, you know, just doing um, weird things like that, basically, like traumatising him, bullying him. Because all of these things have happened happened to us, right, it goes good for them. So she can say, you've took my kids off me because you think I'm going to abuse them, but... One of them's been... Scolded. Yeah. One of them's been chastised and whatever you're saying I've done. My other daughter's been sexually abused by a girl. So they got you back pretty quick. They got us back pretty quick. And I'd say it's only through the neglect of social services that they've managed to even get us back, in my opinion, because Hmm. in the records, when I look at it, they haven't been meeting all of the things that are required by them to get us back, right? So they get us back... I've been abused in care by this girl. They then have to take me to the place where I have to go and do the Barbie thing or whatever. Right? And was was it any was it any more abuse other than uh, trying to kiss you and roll around with you? No, so just her like hitting me, hurting me, and so phys- trying to physical lay on abuse top as well. And maybe just reenacting what she's seen before she was put into care. She got to look at it like that. This girl's in care herself. She's in care for a reason. You know what I mean? I don't know what happened to her. She don't know what happened to me. You just put in the same care home, unfortunately. So we've gone back. My mum and Mark are taking me to these meetings. They're not allowed in the room. So they don't know what I'm saying in these meetings. And I can physically remember after, and I've come out, this is like a rarity. They've took me somewhere and bought me something as a special treat. And we don't really get special treats. So to get a special treat, I must have done something really good. But by now, I'm recognising that he's doing to me what that girl's done to me. And I'm being told what that girl's done to me is wrong. Right? So in my head, I know he's doing things to me. I don't know whether it was the fear of, well, if I now say he's doing it as well, what if they take me away again? I didn't know what it was. Okay, so... You've I now, recognise. You, 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 you've now come back from care. Yeah. You're now, you're now back under your mum and Mark's custody. Yeah. And you're saying now that Mark is doing things to you similar to Alice, like rubbing himself up against you, laying on you. Well, he was doing that before I was took into care. So if I'm honest, I don't remember what age I've been abused from. I can't remember the first time it happened. Maybe my brain's protecting me. I don't know how old I was at all. So the abuse was escalating to more of a... Sexual abuse. Sexual abuse. I think it could have been happened to me from when I was three, four years old. I wouldn't know. And it's, things are going back to normal. I'm, we're back at school like normal. Uh, incidents happen. I fell over at school. I broke my ankle. At school? Yeah. My big brother was giving me a piggyback home. And we bumped into Mark. He said, why are you carrying her? I'm crying my eyes out. I'm saying I've hurt myself. I've hurt myself. I didn't know I broke my ankle. I've hurt myself. I can't walk. Yes, you fucking can walk. He forced me to walk on a broken ankle at six years old all the way home. About a 20 minute walk from our school as a child. I've got home. My mum's opened the door. I'm crying my eyes out. What's the matter? Dad's made me walk home and my ankle's sore. So she took one look at my ankle. It was fucking massive. She said, humongous. 
and got took to the hospital. I've then been put in a cast, an ankle cast for six weeks. I can remember um, distinctively because I had the um, crutches, but me and my brothers used to treat the crutches, you know, like they were machine gun and go, and like pretend to shoot yeah. each other or whatever. <laughs> Not only that, I made a sort of hustle, right? So all the kids in my street wanted to play with my crutches because it was cool to be on crutches back then, right? So I can remember I used to charge them 20p for 10 minutes on my crutches and like, I'd sit on a chair with my foot up and I'd charge all the kids in the street 20p and get a pound or whatever and they'd all be playing with my crutches all day. Um, so things are starting to get semi back to normal. I say semi back to normal, right? We're still being like battered and slammed. Well, well, you, and- your, your normal isn't... Anybody else's normal, yeah, so is it? Normal to us is just how we was living, basically, right? So we're getting back to normal. My mum's got a close friend across the street, Marie and Steve. So my mum was friends with Marie. He's friends with Steve. I'm friends with Charlotte, their daughter. They also had another son or whatever. So I felt like it was sort of like they were friends. My mum sort of was in control. She felt like she had control in their relationship. So she could say, Mark, I'm going to go to Marie's. You can watch the kids. And he'd be like, yeah, all right, I'll sit in with the kids. But he weren't sitting in with the kids because he wanted to sit in with the kids. He was sitting in with the kids because he wanted to nonce on me. Do you know what I mean? Sort of thing, right? So I can remember. So the abuse is, is escalating yeah. at this stage. Yeah. So it's, I can't remember the date. It, it, I can actually, because it's written my social services record. So, on the 29th of March, 1997. You're now eight? No, I'm seven. Right. Right? 1997, I'm born late 89, so I'm only seven, yeah? Okay. Um, My mum's gone out. Uh, I can remember my mum's come home. She tried to get in the house. She couldn't get in the house. The house is pitch black. She bangs down the door to the point. This is her statement that I'm like reading off because I've got it in right in black and white. She bangs down the door to the point it takes 15 minutes for Mark to come and open the door. She says he's acting really strange. Something dodgy's going on, right? And he's trying anything he can to get in front of her on the stairs. And she's like, why are you acting strange? And he's like, I'm not, I'm not. So she says she runs up the stairs and she goes in her bedroom because she's gone to get a top for her mate or whatever. But she said when she's gone in her bedroom, my knickers and night are on her bed on the bottom, like just placed there. She said she just thought it was weird, right? So she's come along to my bedroom and opened my bedroom door. She said my bedroom light was on and I was laying on my bed naked, completely froze still, white as a ghost, trembling. My whole body was shaking, trembling, right? I can just remember I was fucking so scared. I've never been so scared in my life. Like, I, I think fear was just something I grew up on. It was a feeling I didn't know how to control or whatever, right? So... I can remember she come in my bedroom and she took me out and she took me into the toilet. But she's acting erratic and she's shouting and she's pacing back and forth. She's made me sit down and I've done a wee and then I've got off the toilet and she said there was blood in my wee. To which she said, like, I can remember her saying, why is there blood? You know, like, just, a, just imagine a woman just going mental. She's rang the police and said, I think my husband is sexually abusing my daughter, right? It's 11 o'clock at night or something. The police's replies is, this is exactly what it says, can you keep your daughter safe tonight? Her reply was, yes, I can. Their reply was, get him out of the house. Don't question me. Keep me safe. They will be there tomorrow. I can remember now, my mum's got a friend... Marie's come round. I can remember I'm trembling. I'm really scared. I'm trembling. Um, Marie was really nice. She was a, a, a loving woman to her kids. So I could feel the love. So I was sat on her lap. She had her arms around me, cuddling me. And she was saying, it's all right, Beth. 
no, like just comforting me, being nice to me. But because my mum was acting so erratic and coming in and screaming and shouting in my face, it was scaring me more and more. Mm. So I was more scared. I didn't want to say anything because I thought I'm going to be into tr- I'm going to be into trouble, right? This is how mad it is. I can remember physically the next day. Well, it's it's confusing for you because you've only ever seen your mum uh, join forces with Mark mm. and abuse you, and all of a mm. sudden you're now seeing your mum uh, in in a state of shock because she suspects yeah. abuse has taken place. Yeah. And now you must be thinking, well, what the fuck's going on? So I can physically remember the next day. It was he must, he must have got out of the house for the night or whatever. The next day I can remember. Um. Our living room it was like quite a big living room. We had like a bay window, but back in the day, can you remember you used to have them things that went along your windows and you could have like diamond shapes and that? Yeah. So we had that and it was like all diamond. The whole window was like diamond bay front window. And I can remember there's a chair. There's a chair in the middle of the room. I've been sat on the chair. I'm watching numerous Numbers of people coming in and out, in and out, police, social services, my mum, her friends. So the very next day, shit got very real. Yeah, so um sat there on the chair. I can remember distinctly people coming, going, whatever. Do you, do you remember the Do you remember the incident or have you blurred that out? I, I can't remember the incident. I can remember being on my bed, laying down and the light on and my mum coming in. So the, the the incident itself is a bit of a blur, yeah. which you, as a defence mechanism, you probably blocked that out. Yeah. And then, but it's the aftermath that you remember clearly. Yeah. Um, so basically, this is how fucked up it is, right? I don't think social services will get away with doing this kind of shit now, right? But I'm sat in the chair. Someone from social services has come over and gave me a cream egg. And I... You know, if I can remember rightly, what I did was I focused every single bit of attention I had, nowhere else, but I was trying to focus just on the egg sort of thing, right? And I'm looking at the egg and people are coming and going. And then I look up at the window. Who's come to my front door? Except for Mark. He's took both my brothers and walked off with them. And I'm just sat there. With this cream egg, looking. So now, I'm not safe. My brothers ain't safe. You have let this man come to my front door in front of me and take my brothers. Then, the, the questions come. I've got a woman standing in front of me. I can't remember the questions she was asking me, but she was questioning me. I didn't speak. I didn't say one word. I just focused on the cream egg the whole time, the inside, what the colour looked like. To be fair, I was scared to even give eye contact with her. I didn't say anything. I probably shook my head. It says it in the statement, she wouldn't speak. I didn't speak. I didn't say a word. They said they believed that my mum had been chastising me all night and it had put me into a state of shock and scared of where I was just wouldn't comply to anything, not even... If they said, what's your name? I wouldn't have even said Beth, sort of thing. I just didn't say a word. Um, That's happened. They've obviously all left. He's brought my brothers back and left. It was a condition of probably on police bail. um, He wasn't allowed to stay at the house. So so he'd been arrested by this stage, Mark? Yeah, um, in his statement. And what was he arrested for? Arrested on what she, what she said on um, chances of sexual abuse. Yeah, he's so he's been arrested on suspicion of raping a minor. Se- se- um, sexual abuse of a minor, I think it was. Um, they've took him to the police station. They're questioning him, and they've given him no conditions to steer clear from children. He wasn't allowed to stay at anyone's house where they had kids. But he he was still allowed to come collect your two brothers and leave the house with them. Yeah. Really strange. That's just outrageous. Because if he didn't do that, I'd have probably sung like a canary. Of course. That day. But that to me was a state of, you've just let this, like, you, you can't do that to a kid, you know. Like, it's fucked up. You can't do that, man. Like, I was fucking so scared. 
Like, there's the thing, you're so scared, and it's the scariest thing you're ever going to do in your life is come forward and speak about something that's been happening to you. Because you've got to have the courage after whatever's been going on or whatever, right? So I can remember that happening, and he's been arrested. He's denied it. Apparently, I used to sleepwalk, and it happened after I'd been abused in care by a girl. So it was now of, I don't abuse her, she's been abused and she was in care and it's traumatised her and um, I don't know why her nighty and pants were in the bedroom but it it's nothing to do with me. Maybe she's gone in there and get changed. Like any excuse to not admit to it. He didn't admit to anything, basically. What, no, no, no. What about the blood in the toilet? Not being meant, not, nothing, basically. Just basically his statement of him saying, I, I ain't done nothing. She's been sleepwalking. Maybe she sleepwalked in the room, took all our clothes off, and then gone back in her bedroom, turned that light on and laid on the bed awake. Doesn't really make fucking sense, any of it, right? But basically, that's his defence. He said he didn't do it. This is actually where it gets a bit mad, right? So then, looking at my social services records, my mum has gone to the police station, said less than two weeks after the allegation has been made, right? Told the police that her mum is coming up from Northamptonshire to see us and if Elizabeth wanted to tell anybody anything about what's happened to her, I would confide in my nan and then they would come back to the police station and tell the police if they found out anything. Um, but basically, she wants to retract a statement. She's got it all wrong. I have been sleepwalking. I've been sleepwalking for some time. They found me outside in the garden. Any lie you could think of for her to retract her statement, she's done. But how can you retract seeing blood? So she's now saying, because I'm traumatised from my own childhood abuse, that's what's made me kick in and presume Max an abuser when I know he's not. So she's took back everything, basically on the basis of, my nan's going to come and see me, my nan, if they find out anything, they'll come back and let them know. But basically, she made it all up and it's not happened, but this is what it says in the police statement. There has been no explanation at all of why that little girl was naked in her bed and her clothes were in a separate bedroom, right? So this is how sick it is, right? That's happened in March 97. Two weeks later, she's gone... That was the end of March, so this now means April. In April, she's gone and retracted her statement and everything, done that right. And was you consciously aware that the statement no. had been retracted? No, no, you no, You still no. thought there was an investigation? How would I know? I'm a child. I don't know anything, right? they didn't. They didn't tell you. All I know is mum's let Mark back in our house again. Ah. Oh. Yeah? So, then, this is how strange it is, right? I've never met any of my mum's family. I'm nearly, I'm seven, what am I, seven years old or something? We wake up, we get told, your nan's coming to see you. Me and my brothers are like, nan? What's a nan? Well, we don't know what a nan is or whatever, right? Some old lady turns up at our house. She gives me a pound. She gives my brothers a pound. We think we're fucking rich. We don't really get pounds and that given to us, right? Not only that, I can distinctly remember she bought me my first ever pair of roller skates, and I'm talking your four-wheel roller skates, and I can remember they were black, and they had specks of paint all over them, no, like, red dot, a green dot, a blue dot, a yellow dot, and we still had the same bay window, and I can just remember I had these roller skates on, and all I did for the whole time they was there was skate up and down in front of this window because I just wanted some attention or someone to say, oh, you're good on your roller skates, something, you know, like, that kids want, they want approval from people or whatever, right? It's only now that I've sort of worked out what they did. My nan is a paedophile protector. She'd been doing it for years. My nan was sexually abused. My mum was raped by my nan's husbands when she was young. She confided in my nan about it. My nan slapped her in the face, told her not to make up silly little lies and sent her back to bed. 
My nan physically caught her husband fucking my mum and she walked out of the room and did nothing about it. Did you say your your nan's husband's, plural? Plural. Raped your mum. Plural. So more than one. More than one. So my nan, from what she told me, she was born in the Second World War. Um, she was promiscuous from a young child. She wasn't married. She was having sex with lorry drivers, having kids, getting pregnant, being shipped to Canada to um, nunneries to give birth to children to where they give the children away to different people. Obviously, she must have been a bit of a tart. She was going around sleeping with people when she weren't married, having kids. It was looked a down upon. You shouldn't have been doing things like that. So giving the kids away, coming back, acting like everything's normal. So I feel like maybe because it was normal for them to have sexual abuse and cover up and have kids and give them away and not have any emotional connection to them or whatever, it sort of an, an, sets a normality for the family. Do you get what I mean? So, I mean, for your nan for what she allowed to take place and happen and what she'd been through for whatever That's reason. That's not the worst of it. Well, no. Well, so what I was going to say was what she witnessed you was going through mm -hmm. in her mind is probably minor Nothing. In, in the scheme of things. Nothing. Mm. Nothing. Move to Corby. Um, this is when I'd say my sexual abuse probably starts getting worse because I'm getting older. Um, more things are happening to me. Um, with Mark still. Yeah. Um, I'm being bullied. Kids didn't really like me. I didn't really have friends. I was sort of one of them little girls. I would just hang on with my brothers and hang around with them friends. And any girls that did hang around with me, they didn't hang around with me because they liked me. They hang around with me because they wanted to be near the boys and I could be near the boys. So because my brother was one of the boys and the boys and that it was like a group of them in the street, it was like I could be near them because my brother could be near them. And then girls would be like, oh, if we hang around with Beth, for the day we get to be near the boys sort of thing but then I did have um two really close friends and one of my friends Kelsey she was about four years younger than me so it was weird so I based my relationship with Kelsey of we played together and we liked each other and I could be a kid and I weren't being judged by her for anything. Even though I was older than her and I was playing with her, like she would happily just play with me. Her mum would do a lot of things for me. Like her mum would knit my hair, give me dinner, steal me clothes, like literally do a lot for me. And she'd be like, your mum's like, sort of questioning it, your mum and dad like, whatever. And then it was like, anytime I want to stay out, it's up to your dad. The answer's no. I know why the answer's no. Do I want people to stay at my house? No, I don't. Why don't I want people to stay at my house? I'm that scared that if I have one of my friends stay over, what if he does something to one of my friends? Am I then responsible? Hmm. Can you see, like... Oh. So as a child, it was like, I wanted to stay out all the time. I wanted to be out. I didn't want to be in the house. To everyone in the street, Beth's, Beth's daddy's angel. That's a way for him to manipulate people, like... I, I, we have a loving father daughter relationship, but really that was, um, a facade. Yeah, like a sort of, um, what's it called? A grooming tactic. Mm -hmm. So basically, from when I'm a little tiny child, I'm your dad, you're my boyfriend. But if you're my dad, you're not my boyfriend. So the grooming has started from young. So then it, me being called daddy's little angel and things like that, did I believe it? No, I fucking didn't. But, was it so other people could believe it? More than likely, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But then it was at the same time, it was because, because we was going through so much abuse and my mum was so hard to go to or talk to, he was the easiest person for us to go to or to get things out of, even though he was abusing his position. Do you get what I mean? So even though I was being sexually abused by this man, I would still prefer this man to my mum. Well, in order for Mark to do what he was doing, in order for him to sexually abuse you, he's got to groom everybody else around him. Yeah. So then, like, we get to Corby. It's sort of like more things are going missing, more valuable things. It's not biscuits and things no more. It's gold necklaces and... So we're back to him punishing you yeah, again now. Yeah, we're being now. chastised. We're being 
woke up out of our bedrooms again, battered, each other pulled off bunk beds by my hair, nose bleeding on the floor, kicked in the face, sort of like real bad domestic abuse, but them doing it to us sort of thing, at, right? At random, and it's still your mum doing it with Mark? Yeah, so it's just a normal routine for that to happen to us sort of thing, right? Um, obviously, I'm getting older. I know he's sexually abusing me. There's been a couple of times that I thought maybe I should tell my friend, but I don't want to tell my friend because I don't want my friendship with my friend to change and she might not want to hang around with me no more and she might think I'm weird and she might tell everyone and then once I tell her, I have to tell... She might tell my mum. So it was like a constant thing of you want help, but no one's asking me. But then I'm scared to tell anyone. Do you know what I mean? Sort of thing. So it's like a cycle like that. Then it was, um, mum and Mark have made friends in the street. They've now got, um, young lads that come in and sit and have joints and that with them, smoke hash, sheesh or whatever. I was just about to say, so they're masquerading as normal people. And yeah. then you said they've got young lads coming in smoking yeah. drugs with them. So that isn't normal. And then like, having drinks at the weekend and, like, people are like, oh, Mark, you're a stand-up guy. How do you deal with Michelle? She's a nutcase. Him making my mum get a job, so she worked in a chip shop until half 11, 12 at night, and that gives them opportunity then. So the, the first the first sexual assault that took place, you've, you're either too young to remember or you've blocked it out, and it's only post that moment that you remember, but you remember it clearly. Now you're in Corby. Yeah. Because your mum freaked. Yeah. So your mum knew something happened. So really, this is what I feel like. Do you, do you remember the incidents that took place in Corby? Are they clearer? Yeah. I can remember. I I feel like I've probably been sexually abused in every fucking bedroom I've ever had growing up. I mean, like I said to you, I sort of zone out. I go into things. So I would be abused when my mum was in the house because, like I said, the music being played and things like that. So... That was something I would, would focus on, music. If I would just listen to the music and focus on that. Was Mark playing music to blur out the noise? She was playing the music to go to sleep. But that was another disguise for him to get a chance to abuse me and nothing to be heard. So he's constantly looking for opportunities. And there's there's levels to... You have to remember that there's there's levels to sexual abuse and every level is bad. But it's not just that as well. It's, it's more the grooming, so it's like... Do you want to stay up late and have some chips and sausage? And like, yeah, all kids want to stay up late and watch a film or have chips and sausage. But once I have the chips, chips and sausage, I have to do things after the chips and sausage. So initially it was like, as a kid, you want things. And he was the parent willing to give us these things. But they were being used in a way of, now you've had that, now you've got to do this. And then I was getting older and I started thinking... And what, what was he asking you to do? Um, basically, oral sex. He was dressing me up in sexy clothes. He was getting sex toys out and trying to stimulate me with them. He was sticking his tongue in my mouth and trying to tongue kiss me. Things that you do with your partner he was trying to touch me downstairs. He was giving me oral sex and just things that you do with your partner. The only thing he didn't do was physically rape me, but he definitely tried on occasion. But because I would struggle or make difficult or maybe he was worried about noise or whatever, he would back down and stop. So there was a couple of times he's tried to get on top of me and insert his penis in me, but because I would move or scream or whatever, he'd back off and then not, sort of thing. Yeah, he knew damn well in his sick fucking head what he was doing. He was, knew what he was doing to was, me. And he knew it was wrong. Yeah. Very wrong. And then it was, um, you're my little angel. You're special. I love you. Um, all that sort of thing. But then I started getting to an age where I thought, my brothers can save me. One day, someone's going to save me. Um, sort of like Disney. I was fascinated with... Um, one thing I loved when I was young, Fantasia. Can you remember the Mickey Mouse thing? And he'd yeah. stood and he'd do this. And Musical. then the mops would move. And so I've always sort of had that imagination. So in my head, I used to think, 
Well, one day, Stephen and Sean, will, or one of my brothers will come in and they'll see him and then I'll be saved. And it will happen like that. So I was praying to God at night, someone save me, someone help me. And then that sort of gives you the um, image where you can lose faith because if you constantly ask for help, and pray and think maybe there is a God and maybe they will help me and they're not. Um, it made me lose faith because uh, there ain't God and there ain't someone that's going to come and save me. Like, no one's going to come. My brothers ain't going to help me. Like, it got to the point, like, I knew no one was going to come. Um, it got to the point of... So it was like that. I would sit at my bedroom window at night and I would look up at the stars and the moon and I would say whatever I had to say and I would be upset. And I can remember I had a fish. I had um, two fish back then in my bedroom and I'd sit and I'd just look at my fish and whatever sort of thing. And um, basically I was getting older Um Sex was being maybe spoke about like with my friends and they were saying, oh, like, oh, have you ever kissed a boy? So you got to think I've never even kissed a boy. But I know like, so my friends like, oh, when you kiss someone, you go and you put your tongue in their mouth and things like that. And obviously I already know that, but I don't want to make out like I already know that. So it's sort of like, it's getting to the point where I'm getting older Um we're doing sex education at school, things like that. My brothers are talking about girls and pubic hair and things like that. And I'm starting to get pubic hair. Um, it was really weird, actually. We've gone to school one day, me and my brothers. This is fast forward to, it's got to be 2001 or 2002. So when I lived in Corby from 97 till 2002, just... Anyone would think we was a normal family living in the area. My mum were stepdad babysat. So that was that five years in Corby, yeah. roughly. And so for those five years, it was just constant pretend to the world to the world and neighbours yeah. were normal. Yeah, but it's physical and sexual abuse th yeah. throughout. <sighs> Fucking hell, man. Yeah. Um, how did you How did you feel about Mark throughout that? Like, it, did you have any emotion towards him? Hate, anger? Did you love him? I th how did you feel? I felt like. I thought it was normal and I just loved him like he was my dad. That's the problem. So I didn't fancy him. I didn't think he was my boyfriend. I didn't think anything like that. I literally thought, this man is my dad. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, fast forward, 2002. Obviously their relationship is obviously not getting any better, him and my mum's. I can remember we've come in from school one day and it, Everything was quiet and when something's quiet in our house, something's going on because it's not a quiet place to be, do you know what I mean, sort of thing. Mm. So Sorry, where where are we where are we now? Fast forwarding now to two thousand and two. So we're two thousand and two, Corby, another five years of trauma yeah. and abuse. And yeah. when, when location wise, where are we now? Same house. Still in Corby, but still in Corby, we're now still 2002. Same house. And how old are you in two thousand and two, roughly? 12. Okay. So you're still a very, very young girl. Yeah. Um, I'm 12. I get home from school. I think I was in year seven at school, you know, if I can base it off what year I'm in. Year seven's 11 to 12, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I was in year seven, going into year eight. I finished school one day. I've come home from school. The atmosphere is really funny in the house. Um, Usually when something happens or there's an issue between them two, you see more of a reaction from the woman because the woman becomes more erratic and wants to shout or be emotional or smash things. It was sort of like that in our house. So it was sort of when mum's acting like that, something's going on sort of thing. We've come in. I've gone in upstairs. It was like a regular thing. You're coming from school, you put on CITV, you watch your regular cartoons or whatever. Um, and I can remember I could hear voices talking my brother's bedroom was next door to my bedroom, so I've stuck my head in the door and Mark's in the bedroom and my two brothers have stood there, like, in front of him. So I'm like, something weird's going on. I've walked in the bedroom. 
he sat down in, in, in like a position where they've got their hands on the lap, jeans or whatever. I've got something that I need to tell you. So me and my brothers are like, all right, yeah, what? I've met another woman and I'm leaving your mum. I was fucking over the moon. Mm. I was literally so happy, but I had to just be out like, oh, okay. Did you think this could be over now? Yeah. So for me, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Like, I could, couldn't have been any happier. If I'm honest with you, my brothers were crying, but I feel like the only reason we were crying was because we were now like, fucking hell, no one's here to deal with our mum and her behaviour and... If anything, he helped us deal with the situation we're in. So although we wasn't physically, none of us were physically bothered. He wasn't going to be our dad no more. He wasn't going to live there. It was more of the fact of, holy fucking shit, now all of us have got to stay with her. Yeah? So they split up. Mark has left my mum for a woman that lives up the street. The woman that lives up the street has four kids. Two boys two girls. Did your mum know he was sexually abusing you for all those years? No, she said no. I've asked, she said no. Do you believe that? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what it is, right? I'll tell you what it is with me. If I was her, I would know. And that's the way I look at it Mm. because of what kind of person I am. Does that mean she knew? No, it doesn't. Can I say for definite she did? No, I can't. Do I want to think to myself she knew? Not really. No, I don't. Do you know what I mean? So basically, yeah, this is when it gets interesting now, right? We're getting sent to Mark and his new girlfriend's house every other weekend to see our dad and spend time with him, right? On the same road. On the same street, right? So the weekends come, we go up there, we go play, we play with her kids, him and her, out like they like each other or they're in a new fresh relationship, they're giggly or whatever. I feel like he's manipulating, he's manipulating now the whole street against my mum, saying my mum's a psychopath and she's done this to him and she's done that to him. Basically building it as he's been this poor stepdad taking care of these children and this woman's abusive and mental and she's been doing this and this and that, right? So people are gaining Mark's side. Oh, oh, fuck, fuck Michelle. Let's be friends with Mark. He's the more stable person or whatever, whatever. I can remember I've gone up there. It was a Saturday. It was our day to go up there and see him. Um, it was when the first ever Destiny's Child album came out because I really loved them. Say my name, say my name. <laughs> and uh, I've gone up there and they were like, we've bought you a present. And I'm like, well, I've got a present sort of thing, right? And I had the first ever Destiny's Child album. I can remember it's got, it had orange on it. It was four of them in the picture. So it was before there was a three and it had like blurred out like visions on the CD case. And I took the thing out and I learned every song word for word. It was sort of like what you did back then. Cause you could only learn the words through reading the information on the CD disc. Right. And when they didn't have the words, you thought, fuck you. Yeah. You had to listen to the song over <laughs> and over and over and over again, sort of thing. Mm. So yeah, I was buzzing. I was happy. I got the CD. I didn't mind playing with the kids. It was all right until I'm up. I'm playing out the front with our kids. Her daughter, Rebecca is younger than me. Eight. I'm 12. So Melissa's daughter, it's four years younger than you. Yeah, and her name is Rebecca. She's quite a big girl. So she didn't get attention she wanted because she was called Fat Rebecca. You know, like kids, like when kids are kids, they're horrible to other kids. And they're, kids are cool. Yeah, Rebecca, you're fat or whatever, right? Mm. I'm waiting for Rebecca and she's taking long now, right? I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? Why is she taking so long? I've run in the house. I've run upstairs to Rebecca's bedroom. I've got to the doorway. Mark's in Rebecca's bedroom. She is naked on top of the bed, standing up. He is standing up with just a towel wrapped around him. The minute I set eyes on the pair of them and he set eyes on me, I knew what he was doing and he knew what I knew. 
You know when you just look and he, he knew I knew? Mm. And I knew. And I froze. And I didn't know what to do. And I've ran downstairs out of the house. And I went home. I didn't say anything. Um, I had that playing on my mind. Um, I had my mum trying to commit suicide every day. Me and my brothers were coming home from school. We couldn't get in. We would, like, mess around in the back garden for an hour thinking, where the hell is she or whatever. Then we'd, like, start putting our heads in the windows to, like, try and look in through the window, basically, and just see if anyone's in the house. And then, like, someone would be like, there's a foot. And then we'd be like, oh, fuck. And then, like, we'd run around and get the neighbour and be like, there's a foot in the door and my mum's not answering it. And then the door would get kicked in and my mum's tried to gas herself and kill herself. And then my nan turns up and my mum's put in hospital. Sectioned. Sectioned on numerous occasions, right? My nan will have my brothers, but she won't have me. I'll get passed along. My friends' mums have me. Bits and blood. And where are social services during this stint? Why don't see social services? Right? This is when it gets really weird. Right? What about the police? Didn't neighbours call the police and say, we're concerned? No. No. Nothing. Right? Then, this is how fucked up it is, right? She's doing all that. She's acting like a nutter. She's trying to kill herself continuously. I've caught him in Melissa's house with Rebecca. That's playing on my mind. This is just the maddest random thing you could ever imagine in your life, right? My mum's got two friends, um, Gina and Vienna. They become quite a close friendship when Mark's left my mum. It's sort of like, I feel like they were coming and getting information and probably giving back and forth to each other or whatever, but acting like they're my mum's support group sort of thing. And enjoying other people's misery. Yeah, probably at the same time, right? And I really liked Vienna. She was like a young 22-year-old girl. She was mixed race. She had like that good, like style. Like her hair was nice. She wore cool clothes. Like I really like looked up to her sort of like, I thought, oh, when I'm older, I want to be like that sort of thing, right? And it was really weird. I can remember they were all sat there and music was playing. And you know, when you can just feel a mood change in a room, in a situation, the mood's gone really funny, right? And like I said to you, I used to do things maybe to to distract myself and to take my mind off things. So back then you'd get an Argos catalogue and you could look through the whole catalogue. You'd have fucking 1,500 pages in there, wouldn't you, right? Mm. So I got out the Argos catalogue and I'm flicking through, just looking, doing what kids do. And the music's turned down. And then all of a sudden my mum's gone, Beth. And I'm like, Yeah. I'm going to ask you something that you might not remember, but I'm going to ask you anyway, and I really want an honest answer. As soon as she said that to me, I'm fucking shitting myself. I've had that lump. You know the lump you get in the... The lump in the throat, it would have been an apple or something, mate. I felt like an apple was in my throat, right? I've automatically felt the anxiety, the heat, my blood's, like, hot. I'm really scared. She went, remember all them years ago and I found my, I found you in your bedroom and your light was on? Straight away, straight away my heart's going, if my heart could have, it would have jumped out my mouth. It was beating that hard and I could hear it that hard on like the inside of my chest. And she said, did he ever touch, did anything ever happen or did he ever touch you? And then straight away, I think tears have just started streaming, streaming, streaming down my face and I've instantly got scared. I've run out the room and Vienna and Gina have followed me into the kitchen and they're cuddling me and consoling me and Vienna's just grabbed me and she said, look, Beth, you don't need to say anything. She, nothing at all. She went, all you need to do is say yes. So I just looked at her and I said, yes. Then... I was crying. I was really upset. I was so flipping scared. I feel like if Gina and Vienna weren't there, I probably wouldn't have had the courage to say, Mm. yeah. But because of the thing with Rebecca, I felt responsible. Like, if I don't say something now and I'm being asked, this is my opportunity, it's going to happen to her and it's going to happen to 
Who else? Who else knows? Who else it's going to happen to? Sort of thing, right? I said, yeah. Next thing you know, I can just hear screaming and shouting and whatever, whatever. Apparently, my mum has written a note that says, I know what you've done to my daughter. It took your mum a long time to ask that question, didn't it? Yeah. She's gone up to the new girlfriend's house and posted the letter through the door. She's come home, rang the police. I don't think the police or anything come until the next day. She must have rang her mum and told her mum. Next thing you know, it's the next morning, my whole family, like my aunties and my uncles are at my house, my nan... They must have gone up the road arguing or questioning him or whatever. He's denying the whole thing. I'm lying, I'm lying, I'm lying, whatever, whatever. So was he arrested again or questioned again? He was arrested. Arrested. So the same allegation has been made for the second time and he's been arrested for a second time for the same crime over a period of however many years it was between the first and the second. So he's arrested. He's denied it all. He's got bail. But not to his girlfriend's house because she's got children. Bear um, in, bear, so we've got to bear in mind that it would have been flagged as well that, not, that he was arrested for that crime and then your mum retracted her statement. It weren't. You know why? Because my name weren't Beth Connolly, it was Beth Heath Ah. in Corby. This is what they do to hide and get away from the system. So he's been arrested on suspicion of sexually abusing Beth Heath. On the records... I'm Beth Connolly, right? He's just saying no. His defence is my mum's making me lie. I'm making up all these lies, whatever, whatever. Um, My mum now is like a manic depressive. I feel like she weren't upset because of what happened to me. She was more upset about what's happened to her. Do you know what I mean, sort of thing? So it weren't a... Anyone, it wasn't anyone was concerned or cared about me and wanted to give me love and attention. It was more of, look what's happened to my daughter. Give me attention sort of thing, yeah? But it weren't that. It was hor- horrific. You wouldn't have believed the amount of people that were coming, trying to intimidate me, um, trying to say I was putting an innocent man in jail, like, basically, bullying and harassing me as a 12 and 13-year-old kid, telling me I'm a liar. My, well, so this is how sick it is. My nan has turned up at my mum's house and said, I want to take Beth out and take her for lunch. My mum said, OK. My nan has come. She's took me. She's took me to her bungalow. She's locked me in her bedroom. She slapped me in my face as hard as she could. No lie. Standing in front of me with her finger in my face, like, literally touching my nose. I'm a fucking stupid, lying little girl that's going to ruin someone's life. All because I'm evil. Whatever, whatever, whatever else she said to me. To which my only reply was, no, I'm fucking not. And everything I'm saying is the fucking truth. To which then, I've been threatened to not say a word to my mum and she's gone and dropped me home and acted like normal. Then I've had men, fully grown men, trying to chastise me, saying I'm lying. Did Melissa approach you? No. But this is the funny thing. The police questioned her daughter and she denied it. She didn't say a word. So in your statement, did you say that you'd also seen him? I said what I see. He denied it. She denied it. She she knows and he knows it's true. They're clever, these fucking animals, aren't they? Yeah. So I feel like, basically, our court court date was coming up, right? And the first court date was supposed to be Peterborough Crown Court. So the CPS decided there's enough evidence to charge him and it's going to court. Yeah. So okay, then it, a trial date is set. And yeah. So basically, yeah, we've turned up to court, Peterborough, ready for a whole court day, prepare yourself, whatever, right? Get to court. I can remember the policewoman on my case. She was really nice. I actually really liked her. Her name was um, PC Sam Kelly. She's at the court and she said, I need to take you into a private room. She took us into a private room. We've just got to court. She said, I don't want to tell you this, but we have to tell you this as part of rules and regulations. Court has been cancelled. There's going to be a re-date set 
because Mr. Heath has tried to commit suicide last night. Did you think it was a, a genuine attempt on his life? Or did you think it was nonsense? Basically, the policewoman and solicitor said they basically felt it was a ploy for him to get a retrial, to get more time to build his defence case. Hmm. And did you sense that as well? 100%. Okay. Right? Yeah. Then... So he's being rumbled. Yeah. Little by little, bit by bit. You yeah. are you are cottoning onto this piece of shit. Not only that, um, my mum said the street, it was getting ridiculous. Maybe she was worried that this evidence was coming to court from all these years ago that she knew about and retracted. So she was scared maybe of the reaction people are going to have that Noah. So we moved. Because eventually, here we go. So eventually, although... Initially, when he was arrested for the second time, there was a change of surname. So it wasn't, this is the second, this is mm -hmm. the second report. Eventually, they investigate the CPS. There has to be enough evidence for it to mm -hmm. go to trial. So it must have all unraveled that you were the same person. And this was the second time. Well, so this is what's happened. Basically, I felt because my mum was under pressure and she thought maybe people are going to think different of her or question or, I don't know. She said it was for my protection, but I never once said to her, I need to move for Corby for my protection. I stuck up for myself. I did everything I was supposed to do and I did it all by myself with no one's fucking help. So as far as I'm concerned, we did not move to Wellingborough because of me. We moved to Wellingborough because you wanted to move and get away from it. We moved to Wellingborough. We had a new court date. And how old were you when it went to trial? 13. 13, okay. So I would have been too young. So basically yeah. I was at court in a witness room that you give evidence with, yeah. but it's connected through TV to the courtroom. And basically, I can just remember um, his solicitor kept saying, you're a liar and you've made up these malicious rumours because your step to father no longer wants to be with your mother. Um, you've been trained to say what you're saying. Like, basically, just reeling off loads of things. Kept saying things about my mum. Kept saying things about my mum. I feel like he was trying to get... Um, he must have been trying to get a reaction or something out of me. Mm. And then I can remember I was just overcome with emotion because of him keep saying it. And I was purely emotional because what you're saying is not true and you're shouting... He was physically shouting at me and I'm a 13-year-old child, right? You're a liar! Like wearing this wig and whatever and then in the end I went he knows what's happened and I know what's happened he knows and I know I'm not a liar sort of thing right and then I could hear bickering or whatever and then straight away the judge has come on the TV screen um, basically like saying basically halt, 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 halt sort of thing right they wanted to shut the video down and give me 15 minutes space by myself because of obviously the bashment the man was giving me and how it made me emotionally, um, obviously physically and emotionally distressed and upset. Mm. They sort of shut it down, stopped the video for 10 minutes, gave me a break before I've come back and spoke again or whatever. But he... Forgot about the whole thing in 1997, 97 it was. So he's done all his thing and he's gave his defence and he said my mum's made him say it and whatever, whatever. And then someone's come, a police officer's come forward and whatever and said, what about in the year of 1997 when your wife has made an allegation against you of sexual abuse against Elizabeth Connolly, and my mum said the whole court just went, because oh, no one knew. The whole street was there trying to fucking raid him on like I was some liar, and my mum... Obviously, because my mum is the way she is, it could make people think maybe she has made a say it or whatever, right? So that could make people disbelieve me or whatever, right? But the fact is, that's not, tr that's not true at all. None of that's true. Everything I've said was the truth. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. That's what you say when you fucking go in there. That's what I did, right? My mum said when that came out, she said his face, she said you couldn't paint it on a picture. She said the guilt was just consumed all over him. Your mum said this? Yeah, because she would have been in court. She could have gone in court and sit there. But listen to how sick this is. You know, my own nan went to court in his defence for the whole trial. She's an animal. 
Then they would have deliberations, whatever, out at court, see if he finds guilt, gets found guilty or not guilty. Straight away, I think it took them a day or whatever, they've come back, straight away he's been found guilty on all counts. Sentenced to eight years for sexual abuse of me. Obviously my name was protected, but it was in the paper. His name and what he'd done and the sentence he got was in the local Evening Telegraph. Then you'd think that would be it and my life would like start to get a bit better or whatever. But like I said, we moved to Wellingborough. So when you, I mean, that I, I've been, I've mm-hmm. been, in, I've been in a court mm-hmm. when as a, as a victim myself and as an adult hearing the guilty verdicts <laughs> kick in and be announced one after the other. This charge, guilty. The jury finds you guilty, unanimously guilty, guilty. Mm. The feeling, because there's always people they manipulate that are going to accuse you of lying mm. and not being believed when you know you're telling the truth. Oh, it's, it's not it's, that. It was, um, she's promiscuous. Of course. Whatever, whatever. But you couldn't I, prove none of it. I was a 12 year old virgin that had never had a boyfriend. So how the fuck was I promiscuous? Well, that's that, that'll be words from Mark because that's the kind of words predators use. Yeah. To tarnish you yeah. as manipulative. Yeah. Whatever. If I'm ni- manipulative, it was only manipulation from things I'd learned f- from where I've been manipulated my bloody whole life. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like some traits you learn through your parents without realizing you've learned them. And that's just normal day to day growing up life, isn't it? How did you feel when he was slapped with guilty verdicts? I felt really happy and I felt really. This is what I felt like, right? So we weren't at court when it happened. So I had my day at court and then... So you didn't see it through the screen? N- no. Okay. So I get had my day at court, did my evidence, left court, I've gone home. Um, They must have had still two days of court. And then at the end of the week, the policewoman, Sam Kelly, has come to my house to give us... The verdict, like, basically, she's come to tell us what's happened and what the verdict is and what now happens, basically, right? I can remember her saying, guilty, and I can just remember my mum being like, yes! Like, she was really happy. Obviously, I was happy. Not that I was happy. I don't know how to explain it. I felt happy because I knew I was telling the truth, so... I was happy at the fact people knew I wasn't lying. And now the whole street knows you were telling the truth. And when, you, when you're when you that age, the street is the size of the world. Now the whole world knows yeah. you, you were telling the truth. Yeah, sort of thing, right? But then, th- this is how mad it is, right? That night, when the policewoman come and told us what he's got or whatever, my mum was happy. That is the only time ever my mum has let me sleep in her bed and she cuddled me. And she was like, oh, we'll have a special treat tonight and you can sleep in my bed and we'll have cuddles all night, yeah? And she was crying, but do you ever get the feeling like when someone's sad, they're not crying because you're hurt, they're crying for themselves? Oh, yes. So I didn't initially have the feeling that she was crying and hugging me because she loved me and she was proud of me. It was more of I was being there for her and she was... Happy. It sounds to me like she was celebrating her victory because she got him back for leaving her. Yeah, because she loved him and she wanted to be with him. Mm. She got him back for breaking and her heart. And then comes the worst shit because he's in prison. So and what, was he Was he sentenced on the 2004. same... 2004. Was he sentenced on the same day of the, as the verdict or was there a gap between sentencing and, and the verdict? Or do you not remember? No idea. I wouldn't know. But he got eight years. He got eight years. Guilty eight, eight years. years the sexual dog, abuse. And the dog's now in prison for nonsense. Yeah, well, Children. he probably not no more because they don't. They get after that and then they get out, don't they? Sadly, they do. Yeah. So, um, hopefully, he's not out there doing anything to anyone else's kids, and hopefully, I've prevented that because that's part of my yeah. And also, that when the first place when I when I just sort of put a blanket over it, saying he, he got sentenced for nonsense children, it was you that he was found guilty for just sexually me. abusing. But there's always the chance that there were others, and you certainly saved others from what he would have gone on to do, yeah. 100%, because yeah. it's, it's in him. He, you know, you, you caught him with Rebecca when she was eight. Mm-hmm. A, a nonce is a nonce, it's in his blood, it's in his DNA, yeah. and you stopped that from happening to others. Yeah. Kudos to you for that. So my oldest brother, he stayed living in Corby with my nan. He didn't believe me. Mm. My nan has sort of brainwashed my brother into thinking, because my mum's a nutter and he knew she was a nutter, 
your mum's made Beth say this and your dad's still your dad. Confusing, he would have been a 16-year-old boy, do you know what I mean? Yeah? So he's decided he didn't want to move to Wellingborough with us and he's, his school was in Corby and his friends was in Corby and he wanted to stay there. He stayed there, we've moved to Wellingborough. My mum's made some friends, got a fucking local hash dealer already or whatever, right? Going out to the pubs, getting pissed, inserting herself in other people's other people's drama when she's got her own family to take care of, sort mm-hmm. of thing. Like one thing me and my brothers have always felt and um, said from when we were young is she's and men have come before us. So like my mum's relationship with whoever she's with comes before anything to do with any of us, sort of thing. It's all about her, her feelings, what she wants, you know, like sort of like that. Mm-hmm. Um We've moved to Wellingborough, she started drinking, she started going out, she started shagging all different black men. But in her defence, it was, oh, well, now that Mac was a paedophile and you've sent him to jail, if I sleep with black men, then none of them can be a paedophile because the man that did that to my daughter was white. So that was sort of like maybe a thing of to try and make me feel better. Like, oh, well, if I go out with a black man and I bring him in the house, she won't feel away because he don't look like Mark to a certain degree. Do you get what I mean? Mm-hmm. So she was doing that. She was sort of neglecting us because she was going and staying out at her boyfriend's house and just leaving me, me and my brother unoccupied at home in our house or whatever. And then it got to the point my oldest brother had been taking the piss. My nan couldn't control him. He's had to move to Wellingborough with us. He's come over. So how, how, how long did your older brother last with you then? Probably about six months. Six months. Right. He's had to come and move in with us again, right? <sighs> he was at that age. So I'm 14. He's nearly 17 because he's three years older than me. He was, I felt like he was embarrassed. He was embarrassed of our mum. He was embarrassed of our life and he didn't want people to know probably anything about us or anything I've been through, right? So he sort of, like, just avoided me. Lived in the same house but avoided me constantly, sort of thing. So it was only me and my brother Sean going to school, so he didn't really have to be near us. He could do his own thing, sort of thing, now, because he was at that age. Um, But basically, yeah, he... Got someone's son stoned out the head. You, like, in Corby, it was a big thing. You do a lung and a bucket, and it's like a way to get stoned faster than you would by smoking a joint or whatever. A bucket bomb. Yeah, so he's got this little fucking kid, a bucket, right? And he's gone home, obviously, stoned out his head. This is your older brother. Oldest brother, yeah. He's given a younger kid a bucket bomb. Yeah, in the end, well, he's gone home. The older kids, the younger kid's brothers obviously noticed something's wrong with his brother. He's like, who's been getting you stoned? Where have you been going? Like, questioning him or whatever. And then the little boy's gone, this new Corby boy's got me stoned or whatever and gave him our address. And how old was this little boy? Probably about 12 or 13 years old, you know, yeah. But it would have been normal for my brother to be getting stoned and that because he would have been doing it in Corby and when he comes to Wellingborough, it would have been a normal thing for him. Do you know what I mean? Normal for your brother at 17, but yeah. subnormal to be doing Not it. Not normal, but it would have... Probably from the age of 14, he's been smoking and selling selling hash and whatever, so it was a normality to him, right? Then, next thing you know, the door's knocked. My mum's not there because she always used to leave us, at, uh, go to our boyfriends and leave us all unattended. There was about, I'm not going to lie, 30 people outside wanting to fight my brother because he's got this little kid stoned. Both my brothers have got jumped. I think they both took a few punches and kicks and slaps or whatever. I've managed to get hold of my mum, told her... I think one of the windows got smashed on the house and everything, right? But, um, yeah, basically, this is how... This is how bad my mum is, right? She's come to the house and made out her and Michael are sorting out everything. Who's Michael? This was her boyfriend that she was with at the time that she kept going and staying at his house and leaving leaving us unattended for, basically. So Michael wouldn't come and stay at your house? No, she would always go and stay at his. And did you gel with him? Did you know him? I didn't meet him. I didn't know him. Ah, okay. So you just knew him by name? I just knew my mum had a boyfriend called Michael sort of thing, right? Then she's come to the house and made out like she's had to sort out loads of stuff in the window and whatever. And she said to me, you've got to come and stay at Michael's for the night. He's got to pull out bed till I sort out everything with the house or whatever. So I'm like, all right, whatever. 
I didn't particularly want to say that. I didn't know this man. Um, obviously, she's my mum, and I have to go where she goes sort of thing. I'm 14 years old. I've gone with her. I've stayed at his house for the night. The next day, my brothers have turned up at the house. Our stuff's turned up at the house. She's moved us in. Without telling us, she's moving us in this man's house. After all the drama and chaos and everything we've just been through and trauma or whatever, she's met a man, not been with him five flipping minutes. She's given up our house that the police have got us moved into, right, as an emergency moved, and moved us in with this geezer. She's then... Oh, she's, I feel bad for saying it, because, like I said, I don't want to slag my mum off or whatever, right? She's convinced this man she's going out with, she don't smoke, she don't do drugs, she's a nice woman, he's repairing her life because her daughter's been sexually abused, give him off this sob story about me trying to get sympathy for herself through what's fucking happened to me, right? Moved us all in, he's at house. My older brother, Stephen... He was very strict, this man. It was a lot of rules we didn't have in place before. Now, we moved in with this man. We've got all these rules we've got to follow. I'm not allowed to wear makeup. I've got to be in from seven at night. I'm not allowed chewing gum because it hides the fact of smoke. Um, I had to be... My school finished at ten past three and I had to be home by quarter to four when I lived, like, an hour away from school. So I'm not joking yet, when school finished and the bell went, I was fucking running as fast as I can to get home, because I weren't going to make it home in the time I had to get home anyway, then I was being grounded for not making it home on time. So it was like, um, just targets that could never be met by kids that have been through everything we'd been through and do you know what I mean? It was just like impossible. Do you think he was uh, overcompensating because he wanted to be completely different to Mark? I think that, and I think she said it, he was trying to protect me, yeah, and he was, listen, this is what I will say, yeah, my mum has been the soundest she'd ever been when she was in a relationship with him, she was normal, but she weren't normal, she was smoking, she was hiding fags in my bedroom, then he was finding them, she'd be behind going, shut the fuck up, doing all that, I'd be getting grounded for a month for smoking when I didn't smoke. Mm. She was hiding weed and hash in my brother's bedrooms, to which he was finding, to which then he was saying, well, you've got a drug problem, you need to see a drug counsellor, to my brother, to force my brother to go to the police station, right, trying to make my brother tell the police who he's got these drugs off, all these and that, when it wasn't even my brother's drugs, it was my mum's. But she was, because she was hiding who she was so much from this man... Anything she was getting caught out doing, she'd blame us, the kids, and threaten us to the point we wouldn't say anything. And this man thinks we were doing all these things. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, totally. And we never were. But then it was getting to the point where he was he was losing control and getting angry because my brother Stephen was just going out and getting stoned. And this is what he did. He did something really bad, basically, right? He's, he's missed his curfew of when he was supposed to be in. And they were really was funny that about Michael's curfew. curfew. Yeah, so we had a curfew, and if you weren't in, you wouldn't get in. You couldn't come and knock on the door and try and get in or anything, right? And where we lived, there were, you know, when a house has got an outhouse, so it's like you've got a front door, but then you've got another door to come in the front door. Yeah. So this is what Stephen's done. He's seen the house in black, and he thought, I might be able to sneak in the house, stoned out his head, half 12 at night, missed his curfew from hours ago, right? He's come in the front porch and then my mum and Michael must have heard some, some noise or whatever and they've turned on the light. Stephen has absolutely shit himself. He's frozen still. He's, he's hiding in the porch because he's scared he's going to get in trouble because he's late and he's missed his curfew and he's stoned, right? To the point of, he didn't know it, but my mum and Michael see a shadow in the porch. So they're in the house getting baseball bats ready because they're like, someone's trying to break in the house sort of thing, right? My mum's boyfriend charges downstairs, opens the outhouse, meters away from smashing my brother's head in with a baseball bat. Ah, it's me, it's me. Laughing. He's that stoned, he's just laughing his head off, he can't stop. You know, when you get yourself in a state and he must have been that nervous or that anxious, the only thing he knew what to do was laugh sort of thing, right? They were furious. I mean, I've never seen people so angry 
Haley had a right to be angry, obviously. I mean, they thought someone was trying to break in their house and it's just in stone, trying not to get caught coming in the house or whatever. But where, where were you expected to go if you broke your curfew? If you weren't allowed in the house, where was you meant to go? Where was you going to stay? Well, you were on the street or wherever you were before you come in the house. So he's kicked my brother out. Because there is rules and they've been broken, right? But then it's like, my brother's got nowhere to live and he's 16 years old. And we have to follow the rules of this man whose house we live in. Then um, their relationship's deteriorating. I come home from school one day. Um, my mum's got a black bag packed. We've got to go out and go out, spend the whole day at the council. She's in the room telling them she's been domestically... Domestic violence against her and that, right? When I can honestly say, hand on heart, touch wood, everything right, I never once ever see Michael be ever... Heavy-handed. Never, ever, not once to my mum, ever. And this is the only thing I will say, is when they did have arguments and I was there and I see it, I would physically see my mum be graciously racist, abusive to him, call him a black whatever, right, in front of me, and then he wouldn't know what to do because he's like, your mum is racially abusing me and you live in my house and you're white. Like, it was sort of like, I didn't know what to do sort of thing, right? And then it was like, he was kicking my mum out because she was trying to smash up the house and she was calling in the N-word and whatever else. And then I was scared because I'm like, well, I've got nowhere to go. And my mum's being kicked out and I've just witnessed her being racistly abusive to this man that's given us a house and... You know, basically, he's trying to sort her out and make her live a good life that she don't want to fucking obviously live, right? So he's kicked her out. I've had to stay there the night because obviously I've got nowhere to stay. And it's 12 at night. She's been kicked out. She's drunk, pissed out her head, right? She's gone to her mate's house. I can remember, I can remember it like nothing, right? Basically, that night, he just said to me, don't worry about anything. Go to bed. And then tomorrow we'll speak to your mum, like, basically just said, it's not your fault, don't worry about anything, like, go to bed and just treat tomorrow like a new day sort of thing, right? Woke up the next day, I thought I'd better go find where my mum is and see where she is or whatever. Um, Was you scared of your mum? Petrified. Throughout? My whole life. I would never, I could never go and tell my mum anything. I started my period, I didn't tell my mum, I just dealt with it myself. And then when she found out through the grapevine I'd started my period, she was aggressive and angry at me for not telling her. But it's sort of like when someone acts like this to you all the time, how do you approach them to tell them things you can't? Do you know what I mean? It's like she deliberately makes herself unapproachable, so whatever happens, she's unaccountable. And then it's like, well, why didn't you just tell me? Like, all right, whatever, how it works, whatever, right? Well, the last time you did try and tell her something serious, you was accused of lying. Well, this is the thing, right? Listen to this. This is after Mike's gone to prison. This is after she's gave up our house and he, whatever, and we're, she's moved us in with this man and he's kicked my brother out. He's now kicked my mum out because she's a fucking state and doing whatever she's doing. I've gone down to her mate's house to see her. She's paralytic out her face, laying on the floor trying to kick me, Saying it's my fucking fault. What am I? Tr I've already stole her husband from her. What am I trying to do now? Steal her boyfriend? Oh, so she's now defending the paedophile. So I'm in complete shock. She just said to me, "I've stole her husband from her." Mark. Yeah. So how can a child steal a grown man mm. from a woman? Um, just certain things that don't sit well with me, like. Back in the day, yeah, before any of that, yeah, and the social services are monitoring the meeting and that, yeah, my mum's got upset about something with Mark and then the social worker's gone, said something to her and then she's gone, he's got a better relationship with Elizabeth than he has me anyway. And then when the social worker has asked her to clarify what she means by saying that, she's then saying, you're putting words in my mouth. So, like, this is the thing. Since that happened, probably before, I've been called a slut a prostitute, a whore, a fucking stupid slag, a bitch. There ain't one word that someone could say to me that I haven't already heard myself given to me by my own mother. And yet you still defend her. Nick says I'm constantly making excuses for her, but 
when you love someone and you care about someone, you make excuses for them. I just feel like it's something you do. I feel, I mean, to me, from what you've said so far, it's not even so much making excuses. You just love her unconditionally and that's that. Well, yeah, like when I could say about love, I could say, it's bad to say it. She'll say sometimes, love ya, but the only people I've ever really felt loved by is my partner and my children. I I haven't had a love that compares to that. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. And throughout the years, my mum's health has deteriorated and she's had many seizures, seizures and trips in and out of hospitals and... I'm the right hand person. I'm an exa king. I'm the right hand person. I'm the one that's holding her hand. I'm the one encouraging her. It's sort of like I'm her parent, if you get what I mean. So like after the Michael thing and she split up with him and she's left him, this is now when all the mental health stuff starts coming back and I'm now a 14 year old carer for a woman that is constantly being um, section under the mental health act under the mental health act to the point that I'm being um, basically this is what happened I'm skipping school and going on the bus to Ketrin to get to the Adam ward to sneak my mum in bottles of vodka and hash because she's told me that's what I've got to do and if I turn up to the hospital and I haven't got what she wants she is then having a psychotic episode on me this is how sick it is right she literally would go to the hospital and say to them, my daughter's abusing me and she's stealing my money. So imagine I've gone to the hospital one day to see my mum, to care for her, and I've been pulled in a room by the hospital with loads of women, people questioning me, saying, why have I got my mum's bank card and what am I doing with it? And all these things, yeah, bearing in mind, I'm a 14-year-old, 15-year-old girl living at home by myself, taking myself to and from school myself, going by myself and taking care of a fully grown woman. Not one of my mum's family get in touch, want to help. Not one person's rang social services and said, this girl's here and she's struggling, she's by herself. My brother's both got my brother middle brother's got a girlfriend and moved in with her my older brother's like fuck that i'm moving in with them they both left me just left me to deal with everything by myself and it doesn't sound like you ever will but you've not chopped the head off the snake you've still got your mum very much in your life because this is the way i look at it i don't nickel people say to me cut her off and things like that yeah but i'm like because everybody if I did that, would that make me bad? Because at the end of the day, I know my mum loves me and it might be in a fucked up way and I might have had all these things happen to me, yeah? I feel like when you're not loved and you have all these things happen to you, the love I give to people is a million times what normal people love. So when someone hurts me or when someone portrays me or breaks my heart or does anything, my soul is hurt because I'm invested. I will invest everything I have because I love you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I feel like because I have that loyalty and whatever, if I don't look after her and I don't take her shopping and I don't get her medication and I don't go see her, no one is going to. And then it's... So you still do all these things for her? I do everything. I go there every day. I walk her dog every day. You still love her? I love my mum, yeah. If my mum died tomorrow, I'd be heartbroken. And that's what I even think is even more fucked up because how can all these things happen to me and she treat me all these things and I still have that? No matter what, I'll, if someone said something bad about my mum, I'm probably going to go for you because that's my mum and I don't want you to do that. Do you get what I mean? Trauma bonded. I don't know whether I've just been, that's the way I've been brought up. You don't disrespect your elders. You don't speak back to people. You don't do anything to people that have done anything to you. What about people that have abused you that are supposed to look after you? Then that to me is, can I you, say, can is you, neglect. Can you, can you disconnect the two? Can you yeah, disassociate so I say, the two? You've neglected me and you've not took care of me properly. And then she will defend that with excuses and then cry and then doesn't want to speak about it. It's too hard for her and... Of course. Do you know what I mean? So then it's sort of like... It's a cop-out. Yeah. 
Are you desperate for her love even now? Yeah. That's probably possibly what it is. It's not even that. Do you know what it is as well? It's my oldest brother is the golden child. She loves him more than any of us. And then I say, maybe it's just a thing. Maybe it's because it's the oldest. I don't know. If I'm honest with you, he's trauma, he's traumatized the worst because he's done nothing but go in and out of jail his whole life and he's 37 years old. He's on the run right now. He can't hold down a relationship. She fucked him up, man. What does, so Nick, your, your partner, your fiance, and we, we know Nick because he was on the previous episode. What does he think about you still having a relationship with your mum after what she's put you through? He, he said to me on a number of times I should cut my relationship off with my mum. But at the same time, I explained to him, he won't understand how often, it's hard. Like, until you've been brought up in a situation that I've been brought up in, you don't understand it. I don't understand it. My mum's just my mum. Like, I love my mum. If my, if something happens to someone I love you and they cry in front of me, I'll be crying. Because they're hurt, I'm hurt. I'm emotionally attached to them. I don't know what it is. Does it affect your happiness? A hundred percent. Like the whole thing with Nick, like if someone affects Nick's happiness, you're affecting me as well. So I'm a hundred percent behind Nick. Do you know what I mean? Um, would you like to make sense of why you still love your mum and you're still desperate for her love despite all the things that she's done? Because she's, she's done some bad things. I know. But then I think... I'm gobsmacked. Maybe because things she's been through are worse than what I've been through in certain extents. Could you... Right, so a lot of the time, right, have you ever heard this, that people that have been abused, they abuse people or they don't? You either be abused and grow up and be the abuser or you grow up and be the other person and you don't do none of that. Mm -hmm. So with me, I feel like maybe some of it has rubbed off on her and that's why she's justified some of the things that have happened over the years. Do you get what I mean? That's that, so you're, you're, the fact that she, she was abused... Hurt people hurt people, don't they? Yeah, but for me, that's no excuse. I would never fucking... No, I and never I never would it. either, yeah, but... Some people that are hurt, right? Like this girl that was in care that tried to hurt me, I truly believe she tried to do to me what someone was doing to her. Do you get what I'm saying? It's great that you can forgive people because it sets you free. But also, it's still torturous and you're still sort of torment tormenting yourself by being wrapped around that toxicity so often. Well, that's what it was with me. It was more um, for my nan because I thought... She knew what she did to me. She supported him. He got found guilty. She's a, a bit of a sick bitch, right? Because even more, right? I went to her house about a few years ago, whatever, and she was going through old pictures and everything, right? And do you know what she tried to do? She tried to hand me a picture of my mum and her husband on their wedding day. And I spotted it, right? And I've gone... Snap, tried to, tried to grab the picture as, as quick as I could, right? Cause I wanted it. Like, you're trying to do this. She snatched it as fast as she could back from me, right? I've never felt so angry in my life. I went, I'm going. I left her house in Corby and I got picked up and went home. And my mum was like, what was that about and that? Yeah. She knew what she did. She was trying to, I don't know what she was trying to do, upset me. She was trying to do something anyway. Otherwise, why would she have done that? It didn't make no sense. My question was, why the fuck have you got a picture of a paedophile in your house? Mm. Sort what, of thing, yeah? What, what, what did happen to the paedophile? What, what's, what happened to Mark? What do you mean? Well, he'd done his eight... Well, I'm, I'm assuming he served four out of the eight years he so got. I'm presuming he's served four out of the eight years. This is how even more sick, sick paedophile cunt you are, right? When he's coming out of prison or when he was in prison, he's tried to get a solicitor to write a letter to my brothers asking my brothers if they still want to be his sons. Mm. Yeah? You thought, you thought you had that much manipulation over all of us that you could still come and infiltrate my relationship with my brothers and that was never going to happen because they didn't want a relationship with you. Do you get what I'm saying? So that, that even there, yeah, that's still trying to... That's him trying to take back some source of power after he's been found guilty still. Do you get what I mean? Oh, I get it totally. My, my, my dad is Mark. So I, then it's I like, it. oh, we have to tell you because 
it's part of law and if someone's made the allegation, like if he puts forward that he wants to still be their dad, they have to know. Like, you ain't even got your own kids. Why do you think you ain't got your own kids? Because you couldn't be trusted not to touch them, could you? Do you know what I mean? Whether it be beating them up or sexually. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. Could you imagine if my mum would have had kids with him? Well, Which thanks, is strange. If you're in a you relationship didn't. with each other for nine years, married, and you never had a kid. And you was 19 when you got with her. But you want to father these three kids that ain't yours, but you don't want any of your own. So other than, other than him contacting your brothers to try and alienate you and take control of the situation again and manipulate and get his narcissistic supply, because that's what it is. Uh, apparently... What have you heard about him? He has stayed in contact contact with my nan the whole time and when he come out of jail apparently he's a lorry driver and he rang my nan for directions and that's all you've heard all i've heard and i heard that through my cousin that was at my nan's house when the phones rang and he heard his voice and he knew it was him then when he's questioned my nan she's denied it but not only that i've gone to my nan's on an occasion and there's uh eddie stober lorry like you know, like, toy things you get, yeah? Yeah. I just knew, I had a feeling, that's from him. He's been to my nan's and seen my nan. She's dead now, but in the time that he got out of jail, he was going to my nan's and still having a relationship with each other. When did your nan die? Lockdown 2021. That's not that long ago. Um, basically, would you believe it? It's bad to say this, because I don't like... I love my nan as well, even though all the things she did to me. Because still love her. It's just one of them things that I, I've been taught. If you're taught to love someone, how can you unlove someone? Do you get what I mean? No. Even though they've done no. these things. <laughs> no, that's uh, it's a well, real it's a real it's a, it's, it's a it's a real conundrum, and it's going to be very even even what I've been through which you know of, but this is not about me at all. But just so you know that I can relate to 95% of the things that you've said right, right on the money. And I've been on the verge of tears the majority of this conversation. Mm. I've held it back because it's my duty to be strong for you because you're sharing me some real deep, mm. dark shit. But there's just a 5% that I can't get my head around because some of the things people have done to you is absolutely fucking unforgivable. And I would train myself not to love them anymore. You yeah, but... You're saying that, but how does someone train themselves not to love someone you've been probably manipulated into loving your whole life? I'd speak or to... Or told, um, you have to have respect for that person, matriarch of your family. But that's just an order. You have to. It's like, I don't have to do anything. I do what feels organic. But I've grew up living by orders. Mm. So it's hard, I suppose it's hard to get myself out of it, isn't it? And this is, the this is the first time that you've ever really spoke about it as broadly as you this have. This is the first time that I've spoke about, I've spoke about it to my friends and things like that, but this is the first time I've ever spoke about it on any platform or anything, so... And time for, and timelined it? It's been 20 years. Mm, so that's a lot of trauma bottled up. Yeah. And do you feel better now that you've got a lot of it off your chest? So, um, one thing I've always said, I've never had a problem with talking about what's happened to me and things like that. Um, I've did a bit of private therapy. Um, I feel like that's helped me maybe get some certain confirmation over certain things that I was overthinking or questioning sort of thing. Um, but then at the same time, it's like society sees me as a damaged girl with daddy issues, you know. I just don't want to be part of a statistic that someone's said I am because that's not what I am. Do you get what I mean? Mm. Fair enough, these things have happened to me and I've had different coping mechanisms and whatever, whatever, but, like, people say, you're fucked up. I'm not fucked up. I'm still regularly quite normal. And my therapist has said to me, considering everything I've been through, the fact that I am the way I am and I'm normal is fucking an, a, an achievement in itself sort of thing. Do you get what I mean? Oh, for sure. And I do, I'm going to sound like a walking contradiction here, but just to put things in context, so you understand that I, I get it and anyone watching this, maybe it helps them. 
I still love my dad, yeah. who served in 18 years, who I testified against, who abused me and others. Mm. I still love him. His voice still puts butterflies in my stomach. Mm. So when I say I would train myself not to love somebody, just to, just to unwrap that a little bit more, he had a hold on me from a kid because he's master manipulator, so I understand the way you feel. But I've, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even call her a nan. I don't think that I would be able to forgive a grandparent like I would my parents. So when I say I would train myself not to love that person, I would allow for my mum, my dad, okay. But any, anything more distant than that, that didn't have, I wasn't as close to, I would make damn sure that I train myself not to love them. That's, that's what I mean by that. You know, one, it's complicated. One thing I would say is because I haven't been shown love by them people, all I want is love from them. So it was like, sort of, I know she don't like me and I know she fucking hates me and all these things, right? But for someone to constantly ignore you and act like you're insignificant and treat you this way, all you really want is some kind of clarification from them that, I don't know, maybe that she did care about me or whatever. Like, I remember, like, basically, when my nan was dying... It was COVID, she got put in a care home and she physically couldn't even feed herself no more, right? And I just had Benny and I felt like, although she's never liked me and she's done all these things to me my whole life, right? She was fascinated by Nick, she loved Nick. Like, anything Nick did would really impress my nan. So when she come, it was like questions about Nick all the time and what's he doing, more, what's he working and whatever sort of thing. So she was taking her interest in my partner sort of thing, right? And then it was a, because she was getting so ill, it was like she wanted to pay an interest in my children, right? So then I was thinking maybe, maybe she's learned a like, mistake sort yeah, of thing, like, right? It's too little yeah. too late. So I'm sat at the care home feeding her, and mushy peas and, but it doesn't matter because anything she ever done to me, yeah, I would never do anything like that back to her, even when she was dying or anything, yeah, because, that would make me as bad as her. She goes to the funeral? Yeah, I, I went, they rang up and said she was dying. You could come and see her on her deathbed and it was COVID, so you could only have two people at once. And I'm actually pissed off that I did it now because she didn't deserve it. Now I know what I know. As I went in and I said to her, I know you didn't believe me and I know whatever happened happened between us. Every fucking word I said was fucking true. And I forgive you for not believing in me. And then I left and I was like, well, even if, like, if she dies and there is a second world or whatever, she'll know and she'll know that I wasn't lying or whatever. But then when I got my, um, when I got my papers through and I read it and she turned up and then the statement's gone back to the police to retract it. It makes me think she had something to do with it and they both was covering it. She was making my mum cover it up. Maybe pressured my mum into doing it. And maybe that's why I don't blame my mum so much because I know how evil her own mother was. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's where I become vulnerable to it because when you just want love from people that are nasty to you, you just want love. You can't help it. So then I'm like getting to this age where I'm a teenager and I'm just having sex with people because I don't know what love is and I don't know what receiving love is. I just think sex is something people do. It doesn't mean anything to me at all. Nothing. I have no regard for anything like that. Do you get what I mean? I felt peer pressure at school. It was like, are oh, you a virgin? You're this, you're that. So it was like... Living them teenage years, it was sort of like just tr escapism, trying to escape really what I'm living and trying to hang around with my friends and be around them as much because then I can just act normal and deflect. You know, like that sort of were you, feeling. Were you, were you doing things to clock out of your reality? Yeah, all the time. And luckily for me, like I, I sort of had uh, like my best friend Peachy, her mum and dad were really there for me. So like... They sort of like sussed my mum out and knew part a bit about what I'd been through and you could tell they 
they really liked me and they liked the fact I was a loyal friend and whatever and they just couldn't believe really what had happened to me or whatever so I feel like a dad sort of took me under his wing a bit and he would like compliment me and tell me I'm a really good footballer and her mum would make me dinner and you know like just give me cuddles like if my mum was horrible to me or they'd tell me to ignore it or whatever so encouragement like that from my friend's family and then I had another woman as well actually weird right because when my mum left Michael and she, she did the old domestic abuse thing when you're homeless you get put into an emergency housing thing right but we got put in an emergency hotel so we lived in the hotel for eight weeks but in the hotel was other people that were in there getting away from other domestic violence and that right so we met this my mum met this woman she was called Gab she was like my mum's age but I just thought she was really beautiful you know like when you look at people and I just took to her as like a role model and like she was friends with my mum and my mum sort of told her about what we'd been through and then mysteriously this is how weird it was we got given our house and then she got given our house, her house but we lived round the corner from each other so we met each other in the hotel we'd been spending a lot of time together she'd been taking me under her wing she'd take me out she was the first person that ever like plucked my eyebrows and it made me feel womanly you know like I didn't my mum wouldn't put makeup up like when you're young and you're a girl you want to put makeup on you want to wear high heels you want to look like a princess like I didn't really have no one to do that with because my mum didn't do that stuff with me so everything was sort of boyish that I did it was very tomboy -y. so I was very impressed by her and I could go to her house and she'd let me stay there and she'd let me eat but then it got to a position where my mum felt like I was then stealing her friend off her I've met this woman and she's my friend and now this woman feels more sorry for you than she does wanting to be my friend so like she'd do things like Gab would do me a birthday barbecue when it was my birthday because she knew my mum weren't going to get me anything or do anything right and then she'd invite my own mum to my party so like we'll do Beth a party and you can come along and come to it right my mum will turn up, see that I'm happy or I've got a few friends there and we're having a good time, call me a fucking stupid prostitute, whore, slag, bitch, try and attack me, people getting in the way, trying to get her away from me or whatever, and then she'd go home and cry, like I've done something wrong to her. So it didn't matter, whatever I was doing or whatever attention I was getting or wherever I was moving and going good with, she was... Sab hating on it sabotage it yeah jealous of you yeah mm. like everyone used to say it to me your mum's jealous of you and I could say I used to say how can my own mum be jealous of me and it's weird right because she'll do it now she'll sit there now and she'll go I was better looking than you when I was your age fucking sounds like my dad and I'll go oh I'll go is it and she'll fucking go yeah hell. and I'll go do you know what Michelle she'll go what I'll go I've got pictures of you when you're younger than me and you fucking look like a dog darling but I do that on purpose because I think all this stuff I've took and you're still now going to sit in my face and try and make me feel less than what I am and who I am when really I know the reason you're doing it is because I'm 10 times the woman and 10 times the mother that you would ever be or was ever to me do you get what I mean so it's sort of now I'm taking back my power not by being abusive to her or anything like that just by knowing my own worth and not letting her tell me I'm less than what I am. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, and fucking right too. Just to satis satisfy my curiosity, because again, this is not about me, this is about you, but so many things that you're saying about your mum, I'm thinking, shit, this is this is Peter Gillette, mm. this is this is my dad. The comparison, the jealousy, mm. the sabotaging, anything that you want to mm. do that's good, the, who's better looking? I used to get that. So I've testified against my dad. One of the things was child cruelty. One of the things, several things he got guilty for, but this is, this is what I want to hear more about you. Mm -hmm. Your mum was complicit in the abuse. She played her part in that. Mm -hmm. Would you go to court and testify against your mum? One thing that I was thinking, uh, and it's always bugged me, and I'm like, so how come the court never said anything to her? Like, you're telling me this evidence was brought up in court from all them years ago from the social services, like you're saying, the abuse, everything, yeah? 
And that judge in that court didn't turn around and say to my mum, you're part of this or you're partly responsible. Do you know what I mean? Like, where's the credibility on her behalf? It's clear as day to me that your mum needs a stint in jail for what she's done. Well, Did I said, I say to Nick all the time, if this was nowadays, 100% she would have been put in jail. Would you testify against her? Probably, I don't know, probably not. I don't know. It's Maybe, not, I don't know if I've been manipulated into... It's a tough one. I had to make that decision. I don't, I'd say now, maybe no, because I, in my head, I'm not going through what I went through back then, yeah? What about, because you, you've done a lot of things to protect others. Would you testify against her if it was put to you that... Oh, 100%. ...that you could actually stop her from abusing other people? Of course. If I felt like she was going to be in a position where she could do that or I witnessed it, then 100%. That was my driving force. But maybe I feel like, maybe because the abuse is to her own kids. I know people should get done for that, yeah, but... Imagine what she could do to other people's kids if she can do it to well, her this own. This is the thing. People's kids don't really like my mum, you know. Not even that. I take her shopping, right? And we go shopping every week. We go to the same places and that, right? And she's one of them. She gives it to the women in the shop and she's like... She fucking abuses me. She beats me up and everything, yeah. And the woman in the shop, yeah, she just looks at me and goes, like, as if to say, I already know this girl is lovely and you. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know they know that, but I just laugh it off and go, all right. Because anybody that knows me knows I wouldn't ever do that. So when we have an argument or she tries to do things, she'll go, oh, she's trying to hit me or whatever she does, yeah. It's never credible enough for someone to believe it. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm, well, they always want you to justify it. They always want you to be on the back foot answering to them or defending yourself when you've done nothing wrong. They they remember things that have never happened and they 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 rewrite sentences for you. But she has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So then I don't really know what that is. She's a bit of have you ever seen the film Split? Yeah. My mum is him. Like different Stages throughout the day, she's different in different personalities. Then something could happen and she could be aggressive and evil. And then she could turn into a five-year-old child and sit there and cry and stop and sob her out. out. It's very like that. Do you know what I think when people have got these split personality disorders? I think the person that's doing the stuff that hurts you out of these multiple personalities that's the person they are and that's the person that needs yeah. judging. Yeah. Not the kind person well, when it she, suits. She does the thing where she goes, I hear voices. Yeah, well, fucking uh, speak back to them. They tell me what to do and all the, they tell me that, like all them kind of things, yeah. And I just, I've just said it to her for years. I said, I do not believe any of that and I believe it's your own subconscious. And she's like, what do you mean? You're not a doctor. And I'm just like, well, it's not, it's not feasible, like, you know these people that go around and they murder people and then you get to watch the investigation, they're in the interrogation room, they're like, the devil come to me mm. and he told me. No, the devil didn't come to you. No one come to you and told you anything. Your own thoughts in your own head that you have and you've acted upon them and now you're looking for someone else to take responsibility for your actions and your thoughts. Do you get what I'm saying? How old's your mum now? She is 55. Still quite young. She looks old and she's got so many health. She's like on the mate, they've said at the doctors and that. She had a brain aneurysm, an operation for that to coil it. She had a neck operation for a cage, a collapsed vertebrae. She's got two hip replacements. She, like, she's got so many ongoing issues with her health. She's got high cholesterol, high blood pressure. She's at the highest point there is to have a stroke. But she's one of them, she won't exercise and she won't change her diet. And if I try and implement something that would be good for her, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about and I shouldn't tell her. Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of one of them ones. I have to mother her, baby her, and look after her. Will, will she watch this podcast? And no, my mum don't do any social media, nothing like that, no. She don't even have the internet at her house. Is she still using drugs? No. Well, she smokes a lot of marijuana she's still on the marijuana and i'd say she does still do drugs but it's um she must be on meds it's medication yeah it, so people could say medication is not drugs medication is drugs i'd rather smoke weed than go to the doctors and sit on a 
a packet of antidepressants for a, a year. Do you know? I, because in my head, uh, I'm one of them, a herb, I'd rather take something that's naturally grown from the ground to heal you than take something that's man-made in a lab that they're going to convince people to take forever so they can make money for it. Did you use drugs throughout the abuse? No, when I was young, no, never. Um, what about after the abuse? When I got to about 15, I'd say 15, moved to Wellingborough after the abuse, probably year 11 at school, started smoking cannabis sociably with my friends um and then i'll say maybe the odd e pill and line of coke from when i was like 17 18 but like not um binge drinking or drugs just like when parties happen and everyone's together and because i couldn't afford anything like, i didn't have money it got to the point of when i was um 15 and I was at school, I was doing my GCSEs. My mum was in and out of um, a psychological ward and I left school early. Like basically I left school on study leave and I started taking this woman's kids. I started babysitting for this woman and I took her kids to school every day and I picked them up after school every day and I sat with them until she'd come home from work and she paid me £50 a week. So that £50 a week got my gas, electric, my food, and I saved up myself, paid for myself to go to my school prom, bought my own school prom dress, and got to my prom with a lift with a girl that I went football with. Her dad, like, did up his van and, like, made it all cool for us, got us, like, some Prosecco and that. Like, did all that to go to my own prom because... If I didn't, I wouldn't have got to experience them things. So this is the way I see it. Basically, I didn't get the education and the career that I should have now because I put my mum in ahead of me and was looking after her. Mm. So instead of being at school and learning and studying, I was at home trying to make money to feed myself. Because you, you are, you and Nick are both... You're business people, aren't mm. you? So, yeah, a lot of people that suffer abuse, they then go on to have PTSD and they mask it with some substance or another. So I was just seeing if you'd ever relied on drink or class A's no. to to mask it and hide from it. It's a fair play. I think um, what I did when I was 15, I used to play for a football team. So I've always been quite good at running, like, long distance. So... If you ask anyone on my football team, right, my nickname was Rocky because I was like a football factory on my own, just myself sort of thing. <laughs> so it was like my team, right, was like a really posh team from the posh ends in Wellingborough. But then you've got this really gangster ghetto girl on it that's fucking going to fuck you up if you mess with her, right? I was playing one day in a match and we used to play, it was like, it was a division, non-division league. So like you would pay, play properly and you would have to pay and sign up or whatever. And this is how mad it is, right? Was it Saturday league or Sunday league? Sunday. I never once paid for football training or a match. And I mean, everyone on my team had to pay £1.50 a match, £1.50 for training. And I think just because they knew my mum was such who she was... And I think they felt so sorry for me and because they wanted me on their team, they just never asked for a penny off me. So they were letting me go and do it and I weren't paying and everyone else was paying, but they never questioned me about paying. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. But basically, yeah. Um, so was, was the football team a good support network for you? It was a getaway. An escape. An escape. So once a week I'll go football training. I was always getting told off because I wouldn't shut the fuck up. It was like, Beth, stop fucking talking and get on with the football. Like, so I was sort of like the class clown trying, like, basically distract my own problems by being a dickhead to everyone else and making them all laugh. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, of course. So that was like sort of my distraction. So running and then I ain't got to think about anything. I can just run or like football, like, and then I can just get proper stuck in. Like, do you know what I mean? And I ain't got to think about nothing. Yeah, some of the funniest people are some of the most saddest people you'll ever meet. Mm. It's all a mask. But then, like, I get these weird things ha happen to me, like, it's actually weird, right? So, I've gone to this crystal shop, because I started 
buying crystals because I believe in, like I said to you, um, natural remedies and crystal healing and therapy. I believe you should do all of these things before you ever go and speak to someone on the NHS because all they're going to do is pull you with drugs. And I've seen it myself, the weight gain. What, what them, um, for what pharmacy drugs do to people, basically, yeah, they just keep you hooked and they'll keep you on a forever cycle of where you're making them money forever. Have, have they ever mean? tried to get you on meds? Um, so basically, could you imagine this? I've gone to the doctors for the first time. Like, this is what I mean. I've been suffering with PTSD and anxiety, I'd say, from after I've had Bailey for years. I mean, it, in my 20s, it was that severe. I wouldn't go out when it was dark at night. You wouldn't see me out anywhere. Crippling anxiety. Yeah, like, if... If I'm in bed and something happens or I hear a noise, anything, I'm petrified. I'm frozen still. I wouldn't move. You could probably, you'd probably think I was dead or asleep because you wouldn't get any, you wouldn't even see any breathing coming from me. Yet. And that's from where I've trained myself from a child to try and pretend not to give any if I pretend I'm asleep and I pretend I can't, like, then no one can hurt me. What happens when you roll over at night and you see Nick? I'm like, oh, fucking hell. Look <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Fucking hell. <laughs> to be fair, I couldn't roll over anywhere because he takes up all the bed space. He's fucking massive. He's a big old beautiful yeah. man, isn't he? No, to be fair, he's, if I do get anxious and... I have these things. Like last night, Nick was fully aware how I felt and he just tried You're to... You're in tune, the pair of you, Yeah, you? he tries to comfort me and I t I'm not going to lie, I took a couple of propanol, the anxiety um, tablets. Was that like a Xanax or Dizepam? Yeah, it's sort of like that, but the English version. So I took a couple of them and Nick's advice was to me, like, have a bath but before I go to bed, put in some Radox or whatever and just, just keep telling myself that it's okay and I'll be fine and just keep sort of doing that. So that's sort of what I try and do and train myself to do. My version of anxiety, how I how I feel, or I mean, I have not felt anxious as, as such, like an anxiety attack mm -hmm. for years. And I, you, I've always used exercise. When everyone come, if anyone says to me, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm nervous, I'm fearful, I'm full of self-loathing or doubt, I just say, okay, well, how often are you drinking? How often are you sniffing? Okay, well, that's got to fucking stop because yeah. that's making it 10 times worse. Have you tried exercising? Well, I can't fit it into the day. Bollocks. What you can't fit into the day is anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. That's got no no place, no space, no time in anyone's life. Hit the gym, <laughs> hit, hit the road and exercise. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. You use other techniques. Maybe today after we've all been to the gym, you and may then, think I'm going to start training with Nick. My, I am actually. I'm gonna start training um from September because my littlest boy goes to school, so I'll have more free time in the day get, to get to do things. Obviously. Definitely do it. Definitely do it. But I think the biggest thing is people not aware of is trying to work out what your triggers are. Mm. So I'm only just becoming aware now, twenty years later, of what triggers me into the anxiety and to the worry and things like that. So. Once I learn what a trigger is, I can write it down and then I can think, right, so now I need to avoid getting myself in them situations and then it won't trigger me so much. Do you know what I mean? I write things down and I I used to write down things that made me feel bad mm -hmm. and things that made me feel good. And then I stopped writing things down that made me feel bad because if you write them down, they can manifest. So I, I mean, horses for courses, but for me... Anything that has a negative effect to me now, and I'm getting real good at this self-helping myself. I don't write down anything negative. I mean, on, the, on this paddy, I've got a gratitude list. I write it once a week. I don't do it every day. Mm -hmm. Ten things I'm grateful for in the current moment, and I put it on my desk or wherever I go. I went to Spain. I took it with me. It's on my bedside table. I look at it every day. And for that, for that next seven days, I read ten things multiple times a day, what I'm grateful for. I tell you what, that keeps me... It just keeps me in check. I didn't know about this kind of stuff before I've got with Nick. Do you know what I mean? So it's what, sort what, of the, like, the power of words. Yeah, so it's sort of like he's helped me introduce me to things and I wouldn't have done like a vision board and like you said, you gratitude things. So instead of writing what I'm gra 
grateful for. Before I go to sleep at night, I lay down and I close my eyes and I'm grateful for my life. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my house. I'm grateful for my job. Just gratitude. And then I notice like, um, like when you say you talk it into existence and you do it, Mm -hmm. it aggravates people that don't have the same belief system. So my mum will do something and she'll be negative and she'll say something and I'll go, no, da 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 this, the universe. And then she'll go, oh, fuck you with your fucking universe. And then I'm like, well, this is why life ain't working out for you, darling. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I so like it, can aggra- breath. it can aggravate people when they can see that you're on to making positive changes. Do you know what I mean? And they're the people that you've got to cut off. Yeah, so sometimes I'll just take a step back and just observe and do me still do you know what I mean Mm. so I'm one of them people I try and help people as much as I can but when I feel like I've been took advantage of or they're not going to change then what's the point of me keep trying do you know what I mean it's a hell of a quality wanting to help others and be mm. kind to others mm. and, and, and actually mean it. Actually really care about it. Yeah. People. And that seems to be working for you. Yeah. Because it's something you can't seem to let go of, even if someone's bad. Yeah. You're still kind. I know, which is insane. Yeah. But then I'm like, this must just mean I'm mental because but this is the thing. If I knew someone that had done that to someone else, don't you don't think I'd ever be kind to them because I wouldn't. Yeah, I'm sure. You get what I mean? I'm sure if you were somebody else listening to you, you'd be giving them different advice than what you're giving yourself. Yeah. Mm. So, like, I'm like with with you, I've said, to you, how do you manage? How do you cope? Sort of thing. Yeah. Because I couldn't contemplate what you've been through. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So then it must just be the way the brain works, sort of thing. Yeah, everyone's pain is very different, and I think the older you get, the more you realise that a you're not the centre of the show. You're not the lead role and everyone else isn't the next. Like everyone's the lead role in their own life and everyone's pain, no matter what it is, it fucking hurts just as much, just as much as yours. So empathize and don't just hashtag be kind, like actually be kind. Oh, not only that, it's only things that you tell people that people can use against you ever. So the only people that can really hurt you yeah, are people that you care and love about and you're confided in. Mm. which is the most scariest thing. Do you get what I mean? Well, it is because then you start not trusting people or, yeah. not, or not wanting to let people in and, so and, then, and then you miss out on stuff. You have a, like me, I have an extended exterior where people could, like a lot of people say to me, oh, you look like a bitch or you look like hard to talk to and screw face and whatever. Yeah. And I think that is my protection of myself. So if I act like I don't care and I act do you know what I mean? If I put on a persona, then no one can hurt me initially unless I've let them in. Just be nice in life, though, wouldn't it, if we could just drop the front and still be cool? Yeah. Because it, it, it's draining. To- the fact is, when people take advantage of you, mm. that's when the front starts building up, isn't it? This is why it's essential. It's all right to have loads of associates, but keep your circle small. Keep it tight. Oh, believe me, you could ask Nick. Whoever I've been friends with since I was 14, I'm still friends with now. We're still as, just as close. Okay, let me ask you this. So, so how old are you now? 34. So you're 34 and you've still got friends mm-hmm. from when you were 14 years mm-hmm. of age. How many friends has your mum got from when she was 14? No, she ain't got one friend. There you go. Not one. There you go. Or her friends have then turned into my friends and then I've took her friends off her. Mm. When that ain't the case, our friends just end up liking me better. And disliking her complete, yeah. completely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's the, there's no, there's no, there's no match it's there. Like you're stealing, you saw my husband, you saw him trying to steal my boyfriends, you're trying to steal my life, and now you're stealing my mates and all your bitch. No, I'm joking. She probably, she probably thinks Nick was going to go for her oh, rather than you. Probably. No, I'm joking. No, actually, what did she say? She was rude to Nick the first time she ever met him. She went, I did not think my daughter would go out with someone that looks like you. As if he wasn't a good looking boy. Please. The woman looks like Myra Hindley and she's got a cheek to sit and talk about people. Do you know what I mean? So it just and, makes and, me laugh. And Nick looks like Robert Redford with gold I teeth. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that is, if I'm honest with you. 
Oh, Robert Redford, he was like the ultimate hunk back in the day. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, Robert Redford and Paul Newman, they were, I mean, they, they were before my time, but they were like the ultimate men right. in, in their day. That's a big, big compliment to Nick, that is. Oh, right. Yeah. He's in, in fact, he's the old guy in Indecent Proposal. He's got better with age. He was a right ugly fucker when he was young. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> so, what, what, what next for you? Where, do you? where do you go from here in life? So, for me, it's just about planning and going forward how are you going to keep your head level how are you going to stay happy so basically i'm joining the gym in september i'm going to start documenting that and not only that i just want to do anything i can to empower anybody anybody that's struggling anybody that's upset anybody that doesn't feel like they can trust people anybody if you need someone to talk to i will 100 percent talk to you i do not judge people you could be a smackhead you could be an alcoholic i don't care I seriously don't care. Like, if you've got something and you think I can help you or give you a strategy or anything, then I will help you. If you want to find Beth, she's on Instagram at, at Beth Speaks Out. Yeah, and then I've also got... And it's, and it's Beth Connolly with an E. C-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. And I've also got a joint TikTok with Nick. We do TikTok together. It's called Big Nick and Beth on TikTok. I can see, I can see good things you two collaborating, not just as a, as a power couple, but a business couple, or a, an influencer couple, a social media brand. Like, I think you're a great couple. I'll tell you what my main thing is that I said to Nick that I want to try and do. So I don't know if you've seen it, but in America, they've got these group of um, motorcyclists and basically they protect the children. And any child that's been abused and has to go to court and go through what I went through, because I did all of that by myself, I didn't have no support, they go as a group and they support that child and they let that child know, we're here for you, we're supporting you. Like, basically, so they don't have to be as scared as they, they are. I want to try and initially set up a group like that in England, of, whereas where there's a child that needs to go to court, anything like that, that needs support, or someone to care and give them love, I want to get something in place where there's that and I will come and show love and support because everybody leaves love and everybody needs support, always. I've got a strong feeling that shit's really going to change and that the love you put out into the universe is going to come back and it's, and it's going to love you too. Oh, hopefully it does.